the cycle of hatred, the will of fire, the curse of hatred. These three ideologies ran the world. Sons kill their mothers. Fathers die for their sons. Friends become enemies. One massacres people to save his village. And one enslaves mighty beings in the name of peace. But what happens when peace is still nowhere to be seen, even after the so-called wise men constantly kept on failing? What happens when the wars, the murders, the backstabbing never stops? What happens when the people in power are too incompetent or ignorant to hear the plight of people? A strange boy with an unknown past and a mysterious body raised by nine powerful beings away from the darkness of civilization will now stand tall as he has seen the truth beyond his bubble. Kindness, he has enough, but not all shall receive it. Strength, he has enough, but it's time the world knows it. Follow the journey of a strange man who is confused about his origin and trying to make the world better with one head at a time. This story is a you. What's up, guys? It's your boy, Omnisensei. Welcome to What If the Bijou Adopted an Atsutsuki Baby? Part 1. Like, share, and comment on the video. Subscribe to the channel if you haven't subscribed. Also, remember to check out the original story. Link in the description. With all that out of the way, let's get into it. Author's note, before you start listening, let me remind you that my writing style is more inclined towards positivity, wholesomeness, slice of life, and relations between characters. There will be many fights, but they won't be the main focus of the story. If you're looking for a short, action-packed fanfic, then I'm afraid you will feel bored when the slice of life scenes come. The love interest will be Tsunade. The overall vibe of MC will be that of a slightly old man. He will be kind, but not to all. He has a very bad view of the world, because he has seen too many bad things. You will understand when that part comes. I hope you will enjoy this work and vote for it. Thank you. On a planet in the vast universe. Life dwelled to inherit great powers from some ancient extraterrestrial powerful beings. The past was a great era of turmoil, and it still is. Crimes, wars, and murders were as common as sand in a desert. It was an era of uncertainty. Clans were formed to fight and destroy, or be destroyed themselves. Differences quickly grew to become ancestral hatred. Generations then passed, but the hate never subsided. But there was one group of creatures who kept themselves away from all this chaos, yet always found themselves being hunted by the people who wanted to spread even more chaos. These nine beings were born of natural energy, the energy that runs the world, which flows through all, but rarely can humans sense it. Abandoned from a young age, these nine beings grew to become powerful, mighty beasts that could topple the world. But they never did it because they didn't want to. They initially had an old man taking care of them, but eventually that old man passed away leaving them to fend for themselves in the strange world of greedy men. They tried to be friends with humans and initially they were accepted because they were very small in size and cute. But with time, they grew up to become bigger than mountains and people started to fear them. And with the passing of generations, the fear turned into hate for some odd reason. As the humans learned to control their own powers and mastered them, they started to see the Nine Beings as tools of mass destruction and often tried to tame them and enslave them, only to die in the process. But the world never saw this as self-defense. They instead saw it as the Nine Beings hurting humans. This universally made them known as the Nine Tailed Beasts. Even though they had vast knowledge and intelligence, they were still termed as beasts. They then kept to themselves, living in temples made for them by humans when they were still considered godlike beings and not beasts. 
200 years before the foundation of Kanoha. Haha, <laughs> catch me if you can, Karachan. A giant beetle-like creature flew at a very high speed over the forest. Stop, Chome. We all decided on this. I am the eldest of all. You must listen to me. A giant orange, nine-tailed fox ran after the beetle. I am lucky Komi I-7. No one can bind me in chains, not even you. Chome shouted back in his low-pitched funny voice. Although they were 500 years old and were very mature when it came to most things, they still had at least one character trait that overshadowed all others. Like here right now, Chome, who is jolly and fun-loving, and Karama, who is arrogant and grumpy most of the time. You ate the tasty food stored for tomorrow. You will get punished for this, Karama shouted. You can't punish me if you can't catch me. Besides, we only eat to taste it. So what's the big deal? Chome flew up. While the two were running around, suddenly, a bolt of lightning fell from the sky. It was white in color and covered everything in bright light for a few seconds. Boom, whoa, what was that? Chome exclaimed and flew towards it. You dare to defy me, Chome. I will get you. Karama was shouting from the ground as he saw Chome getting away. Both of them headed directly towards where the light had fallen. The more they got closer, the slower they got. Karama eventually stopped chasing him and was basically running alongside him. Soon, they had arrived at a giant crater, so big that the forest in a few kilometers of radius had been turned into dust. What happened here? Chome questioned. Something fell from the sky. Karama said the obvious thing. They both dashed towards its center. The closer they got, the hotter it became. But for them, it was nothing. Oh, I hear something, Chome exclaimed. They continued and after a few minutes arrived at the center. There, a flat stone was present and on it was a naked little human baby. Around the baby, white sandy dust was floating. I feel an immense chakra from it. Too much in fact. Karama got alerted and his first stood up in response. What are you saying? Look at him. Ah, uh, so cute. Chome gasped. The baby was very small and naked. His skin was as white as his hair is. He looked human yet also not human. He looks like the old man, just without the horns and weird eyes, Chome noted upon observing him. Chome started flying towards him slowly. The baby was busy looking at the sky happily while making cute noises. He was new to all this and didn't have any idea of what was going on around him. To him, everything was fun. Hello, I'm Lucky Seven Chome. Chome arrived near the baby. His towering body was so huge that the baby was eclipsed in a shadow. The baby's red eyes looked at the tall, beetle-like being. He knew no concept of fear or scary monsters as such. Chome was as new to him as the bright marble in the sky he couldn't look straight at. Yeah. He made a cute noise, trying to repeat after Chome. Chome giggled hearing that. Hee <laughs> hee, he's so cute. How did he come here? I bet he's not normal. Don't touch him, Chome. He could be from out there. You know what the old man had warned us about. Karama advised Chome strictly. What are you saying? They send a child to catch us? But I don't think he's one of them. Feel it, Karachan. He's totally made up of chakra, just like us. I sense no bones or blood in him. Chome observed. Karama raised his eyebrow hearing that and looked intently at the baby. He used his senses to check up on him and, indeed, the baby had neither bones nor blood in him. He was fully made of chakra. How is this possible? Karama wondered. What should we do? He's so small. Chome asked, looking at the baby. Leave him, I hate humans. They are so short-sighted and arrogant. Someone will either take him in or he'll die by the hands of nature. Karama shrugged off and turned around. UWA. The baby made cuter noises. Karama's furry ears perked up, but he didn't look back. Meanwhile, Chome was quiet and stood close to the baby. He didn't have eyes, it was just a helmet-like shaped head. But when he looked at the baby, the baby also stared right back at his face. This happened for a minute. 
They just looked at each other. All the voices around them had gone silent, as if they were coming to some sort of an understanding between them. But you're not a human, right? You're just like us. I have decided. I'm adopting you, Chome proclaimed. He picked the baby delicately. Surprisingly, the baby didn't cry at all and instead made cute noises and enjoyed being lifted in the air. Sadly, Chome didn't have soft fur and neither soft hands, so he had to be very careful this time. He then flew back to the side of Karama and didn't say anything. Good job, we can't keep a child with US, IT wa. Karama was still speaking when he heard. Yechi. He quickly looked back, his eyes widening, and he angrily asked, What are you doing? I'm a daddy now, Chome replied cheekily and hummed a song while continuing on his way. Are you crazy? We can't have a human child with us. Besides, when he grows up, he's going to hate us. Karama argued. Chome immediately lifted the baby up close in front of Karama's face. Look at him. Does he look like he would hate you? Karama stared at the baby's face. He was obviously very cute, to the point you can't even consider harming him. Boop the baby suddenly patted the nose of Karama. Karama's face turned softer, but he was still not convinced. When the humans find out that we have a child with us, they would tag us as kidnappers or worse, man-eaters. Come on, he's not even human. When did you last see a human completely made out of chakra? Don't you see? He's just like us. Do you want him to go through the same things we went through? I'm sure the others will like him. You're just being grumpy, huh? Chome scoffed and ignored Karama for now. Sigh. Does he even know how to raise a human child? Karama muttered to himself and followed behind. Here, you carry him. Chome suddenly put the baby on Karama's back. Before Karama could angrily shout, the baby quickly made himself comfortable on the soft fur and fell asleep. Sai, I'm gonna regret letting you do this, aren't I? He muttered. You bet. Chome replied and happily led the way. Karama was treading very softly on his way back. He moved fast, but in a way that his back would not be bumpy for the baby. At the moment, all the tailed beasts were living in a big temple in the eastern vast jungles. They were not always in harmony, but they somehow stayed together. When the two returned home, Chome loudly announced, Everyone, look what I found. All of them left whatever they were doing and came to check it out. The baby looked at all the big strange creatures and smiled at all of them one by one. He's just like us, made of chakra. I have decided to adopt him. Who else will do the same? Chome questioned. Gyuki tickled the baby with one of his tentacles. Hmm, I can feel that he is similar to us. He is certainly not a human. Son Goku laughed. Gurara, I'll teach him to jump on trees, except for tails, he's just like me. What does he eat? Saiken questioned. Chome was confused. I don't know. What do humans eat? Meat. Isabu wondered. Karama scoffed. Ha, huh, he's a baby. He cannot eat hard things. He will only drink milk. Where can we get that? Should we steal cows from farmers like before? Shikaku wondered. Hmm, a dilemma indeed, Gyuki muttered. By the way, what's his name? Matatabi asked. Poof, Feichi pooped, Shikaku exclaimed loudly. Chome at the same time shouted. I know. We shall name him. Poopy. No. How would you feel if someone named you an insect or someone named Saiken Fatty? Yuki immediately protested. Yes, you're right. This is not good. Hmm. What should we name him then? Chome thought hard before looking at the others for answers. Oh, I got one. Why not name him after his skin and hair? Shikaku suggested. All of them contemplated the name for a few minutes. What about Shiro? Matatabi asked. No, that sounds like a dog's name. Chome protested immediately. Shine. Shikaku muttered. Bam, he received a knock on his head from Gyuki. That means death. Karama then came up with one name. What about Shuriken? Whoa, 
I like it. Nice. Cool. All of them gave their approval. But then, Chome raised another question. What about his surname? When my son grows up and goes to the human world, he will need one. Of course, because Kurama was the one to suggest it, he already had the surname sorted. He started drawing something on the ground with his nails and spoke. Let's make a Dhamma. It is also related to our Bajadama. Next, according to what our old man taught us, Dhamma is the character representing the connection between heaven and earth. The single drop stroke on the bottom right of Dhamma implies heaven's essence on earth. Because he came from the sky and is made of chakra, he truly is heaven's essence on earth. All the tailed beasts had stars in their eyes hearing this. This was so fitting for the baby, it also referenced them, so it was the icing on the cake. They felt like proud parents already. Karachan, since when did you become so wise? Saiken questioned. Kurama scoffed. Huh, I was always smart, you just didn't know it. Chome cheers. Then from today, we all will have Dama as the surname. Like a big family. Matatabi, a female picked the baby in her soft paws and smiled. Welcome to the family, Shirakandama. You wa. They chuckled at the cuteness and the positivity brought by the little baby. Just not long ago, the nine beasts were on the verge of breaking up and going their separate ways. But now, here they were entertaining and naming a child. Now, one of you should change his poop clothes, Karama ordered. What does he even poop? Isn't he just made of chakra? Son Goku questioned. Let's check it out then, Chome said and carefully took off Shuriken's makeshift diaper. Wah, Chome gasped. There is nothing, Shikaku exclaimed. Then what was that sound before? It also smelled so bad. Kurama wondered. A cough, guys. Um, actually, it was me. I farted. Saiken confessed. He is one of the kindest of all the siblings but his only flaw is his stomach. Yuki facebombed himself. Poor Shuriken, he was nearly named Poopy because of you. And this is how the big Dama family started. Shuriken was a very calm child and rarely cried. He didn't require a lot of food, so the tailed beasts did not have to worry much about it. However, even though it was mostly unneeded, they did get food for him all the time so he could taste new things. Thus, in this manner, little by little, Three months had already passed. In the past three months, all nine of them had turned into a parent for the child. Shuriken was also very comfortable with them, playing around them and climbing their giant bodies as he pleases. At night, they would make a circle and have Shuriken sleep in the middle, keeping him safe from all dangers. Kurama, who had the best fur of all, served most of the time as a bed for the baby. After the first month, Shuriken started crawling and increasing the worry of the nine beasts. But they all knew more techniques than possible related to tracking people. Are you sure? Last time we also stole the cow from here. Kokuo asked. Yuki nodded. They have a milking cow. We can have milk for the coming weeks for a little Shiro with it. Okay then, let's do this. We've tried offering them gold in return for food and drinks but they so foolishly try to kill us. No need to care about them anymore. Kurama grumpily said, it was actually overkill for three tailed beasts to come to steal a cow, but they had heard that people of the Uchiha clan were on the move, so they tried to be safe. Uchihas were one of the only clans that possessed the power to bind them, but even then, they'd need to be very powerful and have the highest evolved Sharingan, which was not an easy thing to come by. The three slowly walked to the edge of the tree lean closest to the village. They got into the position and talked about the next strategy. Kurama spoke telepathically. Yuki, you will be the diversion. You look the most frightening. Nobody expects to see a bull with an octopus's body. Meanwhile, Kokoro looks like a horse. The last time I tried it, a kid called me Foxy and came to hug me. Haha, <laughs> I remember that. All right. I'll scare them. Yuki agreed. Brothers remember, do not hurt anyone. Koko reminded them. With this, Yuki jumped from there and landed in the middle of the village street. 
Hiya. I'm going to eat you all. Hiya. Yuki started shouting in the most non-threatening and uninterested voice, but people still screamed and ran away frantically. At the same time, Kokuo and Kurama went to the barn. Kurama had fingers, so he picked the fattest and biggest cow there was. Kokuo picked another one in his jaws, but then they noticed the calves, so they picked them too and dashed away. A quick and simple execution. Once they had entered the jungle, Kurama contacted Gyuki. Return now, we got them. Yuki stopped scaring the villagers and jumped from their back to the forest. The people took a sigh of relief, seeing that no one was harmed and nothing was damaged. It would take them a few days to realize that some of the cows had gone missing. The three brothers had purposefully traveled a thousand mile to get the cow because they didn't want to lead anything back to their location, which they had changed now. Right now, they lived in the huge jungle spanning hundreds of kilometers in the area. There was also no human movement nearby. Once they returned, they put the new milk cows down. All the tailed beasts gathered around. The two cows were scared to no end and were shivering. Out of nowhere, little shuriken also appeared, now crawling on his four limbs. G-A-G-A-M-O-M-O-L-O. He spoke something in his secret baby language that no one understood. He immediately went to the cow and climbed on its back. But then the cow started jumping around like crazy. All of a sudden, Chome exclaimed loudly, Wait, why does the cow have no boobies? All tailed beasts looked carefully. Shuriken was laughing happily, somehow still staying on top of the jumping cow. P.T. Matatabi face bought herself. You fools, that's a bull, not a cow. Who picked it? It was Kurama. Kokuo immediately cleared himself of the sin. What? They all looked the same. Kurama defended himself. Sai, you are arrogant and refuse to learn. You can't be the leader. I propose we select a new leader. Matatabi put forward the motion. All tail beasts nodded. Shikaku immediately raised his hand. I choose myself. Matatabi shook her head. No, you can't vote for yourself. Also, you and Chome are not allowed to be the leader. You'll doom us. Hey, don't do that to my face. I'm the smartest of you all. Don't forget that. Kurama protested. But you're also the dumbest and make stupid mistakes because of your inflated pride. Yuki argued. Come on, I am the best, Kurama said. See, that's the problem, Matatabi added. Immediately, the voting was held and Gyuki was made the new leader. Kurama was told to work on his ego if he wanted to be the leader again. Huh. What do we do with the bull now? Kurama asked them grumpily. Should we eat it? Isabu inquired. Chome immediately shouted. No, look how happy Shirochan is. Ihihihi. Aya aya. Shuriken was still on the bull's back, enjoying the jumps. Hmm. He does look very happy. But how is he still on the back of that bull? Saiken wondered. Look. Look at his feet. Son Goku excitedly pointed. They all looked and found the baby was using chakra to stick to the back of the bull. He seemed to be doing it masterfully too, as he was also jumping on the back. He, I am excited about what his future will hold. He will certainly become very powerful. Yuki commented, but right now he is very vulnerable. We must keep little Shiro safe, Kokuo said. Good now, who will milk the cow? Kurama quickly asked, but he was given cold treatment because he is no longer the leader. Yuki is, so the decision was his. It will be Kurama. You have fingers, so you milk the cow. What? My claws will kill it. Kurama protested. Huh, don't try to fool me. Use your chakra manipulation to do it. Yuki ordered and ignored him to go and do other work. Seeing his plight, Shikaku smirked at Kurama's face and said, Good luck, Foxy. Kurama grits his teeth. You trash panda. Shikaku, you will be responsible for cleaning the cow, calves and the bull, and disposing of their poop. Yuki's order came from a distance. Shikaku's shoulder fell, 
and Kurama started laughing. Ha ha ha, serves you right. Space. Z z z z z. some kind of a portal opened in the space above the earth. A single white-skinned and black-horned person came out of it. His eyes seemed lifeless and emotionless, looking as white as his skin. He didn't have any trouble existing in the vacuum of the space. The moment he came out of the portal, he looked at the planet below intensely. So, this is where he went to, but the god tree here looks underdeveloped yet. I shall find the essence first, he muttered to himself, and flew down towards it. Shuriken was a weird baby. He grew up very slowly. From his mind, he was like a blank slate, needing to be taught everything, even how to feel and how to react to pain. But recently his body was starting to develop a little faster. All the Bija siblings guessed that it was maybe due to Shuriken being like them, made of chakra. So it takes time for him to gather natural energy from the air and grow up. Well, some of that was really what a baby was supposed to be like, but the poor Bijou didn't know that. They just cared about making sure he was well-fed, clean and healthy. It had been many decades since all of the siblings got together to care for this strange baby. Unknowingly, they all got closer like never before. They still fought, squabbled and had their differences, but overall, they had each other's back. All because of a small baby coming into their lives. Shuriken has started to walk on his legs now, albeit while stumbling and falling. It was something strange for Kurama, as he had studied the human body before while eating them, and Shuriken didn't have any bones as such. Why was he finding it hard to walk? He also did not start talking yet. And for the Bijou gang too, trying to avoid meeting humans was becoming very hard to do. Much harder, because now they had to gather milk for the child. By now, they had terrorized about 20 villages and stolen their milking cows. Phew, it's hard work milking a small cow when you're this big. Saiken came beside Lil Shuriken and sat down. He was, as always, a sweaty blob. Kurama grunted, you could have just made yourself smaller, but it's uncomfortable that way. Anyway, after doing it so many times, I have now become a master milker. Saiken proudly claimed, Sasa, Shuriken threw his play ball towards Saiken, telling him to play with him. Saiken is one of the kinder-tailed beasts, and he is also very energetic. Yes, let's play. He cheered and threw the ball at Shuriken for him to catch. But Shuriken was too small, and the ball directly hit his face, leaving behind a red mark. If it was thrown by some human, it would not have done anything but an almighty-tailed beast threw it. Leading to this, all of a sudden, a strong silence ensued around them as all the tailed beasts present looked at Shuriken with a sense of uncertainty. All of them were scared of his crying, because although he rarely cried whenever he did, it was so loud they would feel their ears would burst. ARGH, you dumb fatty. Shikaku cursed. Cover your ears. Isabu whimpered. Shuriken sniffed a few times and looked like he would cry at any given moment. But then he suddenly smirked at all of the scared, tailed beasts. Key! Thud, all of them fell down, relaxing their bodies. Kurama came to Shuriken and put him on his back. Haha, you are getting smart, boy. Good! There is no advantage in being dumb, like Shikaku or crazy like Chomei. What did you say? Fight me. I will show you I am stronger. Shikaku jumped up. Kurama ignored him. Go away, raccoon. I have already defeated you tens of times already. But I have learned a new sealing technique, and come fight me in a desert this time, I will make you eat dirt there. He boasted. Desert is his most suited region, and he felt the strongest there naturally. Kurama didn't even reply to him, and just went out of their camp to stroll around with baby shuriken. In the past 20 years, he had come to like shuriken. Initially, he just shrugged the presence of a baby in their camp. The only ones who really treated shuriken well were Gyuki, Chomei, Saiken, and Kokuo. Meanwhile, Shikaku, Kurama, Isabu, Matatabu, and Son Goku didn't really bother him. 
This was because Gyuki was just interested in the strange baby made of chakra. Chome is a happy-go-lucky person and just like Shuriken. And Saiken is an energetic being but kind too, so he felt like helping when others didn't. This left Kokuo, who is indifferent overall, but would help if someone asked him, as he is very polite. Shikaku Kurama and Son Goku detested humans. Isabu and Matatabi didn't care about him, but still held a bit of hostility because Shuriken looked like a human. As Shuriken didn't know what anger or hostility meant, he would constantly get close to all of them and play. Sometimes hugging Kurama's fur and falling asleep, sometimes swinging or climbing to Yuki's tentacles, playing with sand while sitting on Shikaka's head, making weird drawings on the ground with Son Goku, and playing catchball with the cat-like Matatabi. He was around everyone and slowly became a part of their life. Every night, they would sleep around him, and every morning, the first thing they'd do after waking up would be to check on him. There was once an incident where he went missing but was later found sleeping on the back of Kurama. He was so small that he had disappeared in the fur. Slowly, all of them felt like Shuriken wasn't really a human. He might look like one, but his body is made of the same material as them. Hence, he was considered a part of their family. Haha, enjoying the air, Shiro? Kurama asked as he steadily ran through the jungle. Because of Shuriken's skin and hair color, he was called Shiro for nickname. I, uh, Shuriken affirmed with his cute voice and a toothy smile. Good. Today I will try to teach you what we call Bijudama, Kurama revealed and turned towards a giant canyon. But while on his way, he saw a large group of humans traveling together towards the same canyon. He stopped in his tracks and tried to listen to what all the people were saying. He used his chakra to make a bubble around Shuriken so his voice does not go out. Uh, village chief, how long will we have to travel? Even the bulls are tired now. A young man asked another old man. The old man, supposedly the village chief, replied, even the women are not complaining. Why are you? We must go further. Because no matter how much distance we keep from them, the bloody flames of wars between the Senju and Achiha clans will keep on expanding like wildfire. We lost so many people this time just because we were in their path of destruction. In the eyes of those mighty shinobi, we normal people are nothing but meat bags. No better than the bull you were cursing just now. This whole group of about 150 people consisted of mostly women, children, and the elderly. They had a few carriages to carry their luggage and food. Most of them looked sad, injured, and hopeless. Their whole village was destroyed by that big green skeleton monster made by one of the Achiha clan's people. Most people here had lost someone dear to them. They had traveled hundreds of miles in the past eight days, just wanting to find a faraway place to live in peace. To again build their village. Ma, I'm hungry. A little boy, about five, called out his mother, who was walking alongside the carriage on which the boy sat. She was bleeding from her feet, as her bamboo sandals had already waned out. Just a little more, Jean. Just a little more. A, she tried to assure him, but her feet were hurting too much now. I, oh, all of a sudden, a cute gibberish-like sound fell in her ears. She looked around herself to see where it was coming from. What was that? Did I lose too much blood? She felt scared that she would die at this rate. Her son, Jean, only had her now, as her husband had just died in the village. She looked down to see how much blood she had bled ever since they stopped here to drink water. But, blowing her mind to the seven sky, there was a baby nearby her on the ground, and the baby had kept his arms above her feet, emitting some kind of bluish light from his palm. A.H. I feel a no pain, she loudly exclaimed. Attracted by her voice, a few people near her came over. They saw the cute little naked baby, miraculously healing the woman's feet. After a few seconds, her feet were as good as ever. Then, the little baby turned to another set of feet, healing them. 
In the baby's defense, he was just crawling and couldn't see the faces of people. One by one, he healed the feet of all those who were severely injured. H-E-Y, who are you? The little boy from before, Gene, jumped down from the cart. But the baby was too small to reply. Oh, he's so cute. Gene thought and quickly proceeded to pick the baby. Okay, from now on, you are my little brother, he declared. P-A-P-A, -A, the baby patted Jin's head twice with his chubby palms. Gene immediately felt full. Whoa, what a magical bab, brother. He was awed. The same was the reaction of all the people there. They were asking each other who this baby was, but none had the answer. Some even started to say that he was a guardian angel. Karama was busy listening to the two humans at the front of the caravan. He scoffed after listening, H-U-H humans never learn to live in peace, always fighting and killing their own. Let's go, Shiro. We have training to do, he said, and turned around. But W-A-A, where did he go? Shiro, Shiru, he shouted loudly. His voice resounded around the whole forest, and in response, he heard the loud cheering of Shuriken. A-H, how does he get around my chakra? He cursed himself for his lack of awareness. He arrived at full speed, jumping out from the middle of the trees, stomping over many of them. With each of his jumps, the ground shook. The 150 people in the caravan shivered in fear, thinking what calamity they had to face now. Kurama had his fangs out as soon as he saw Shuriken in the arms of a human. Give the child back, he roared, so loud that each felt their hearts vibrate. Jean, the little boy who was holding Shuriken, felt his legs freeze. All were feeling that, but he was feeling it more because the huge red fox was looking straight at him. All the people immediately kneeled there and started praying together. Oh, great protector spirit of the jungle. Please let U.S. go. We did not mean to anger you. Oh, Gria. But immediately the old village chief ran in front of little Jean covering him. He knows what this fox is. He had heard about it from his own grandparents. That this beast was once a fox living in a temple for the purpose of protecting it in a forest region. But humans kept on destroying the forest turning the fox into such a ferocious beast. Great protector of the forest, please spare U.S. We have lost everything already, he pleaded. Give Shiro back. Now, Karama roared. Nobody could be so dense as to not understand who this Shiro was. There was only one miraculous white-haired baby around them. The village elder took the child from Jean. But Jean, although afraid started protesting. No, don't. The fox will eat him. Stop. Aya, uh, Gugu. goo. Shuriken was waving towards Karama, wanting to get back on his soft fur again. But Karama heard what the little boy said. He was ready to defy him, someone who could kill all of them here in a matter of seconds. Leave him, Jean. Do you want all of us to die? We don't know this baby. The village chief fought. But, why you said babies are the most innocent and purest stage of a human cycle? They must always be protected. How can we let him die? Jean cried. It was strange how he was fighting so strongly for Shuriken. Maybe Shuriken did something to him, or he felt something for Shuriken. It was obvious for all that he was being stupid, but brave. Immediately, a village member dragged him back and covered his mouth. The village chief lifted Shuriken up towards Karama. Here, please take him and spare us. Please. Karama growled at them to scare them, and then slowly brought his face near Shuriken. Hea <laughs> Kuku. -K -K Shuriken patted Karama's nose. Then, to the horror of all the people there, Karama opened his mouth and gulped Shuriken whole. Author's note. Decades have passed. Just to make it clear, author's note, remember, we are still a few decades away till Kanoha is formed and other villages or nations are founded. All the tailed beasts do hate humans, but not to the level they did in the canon. 
Because till now, they have only been called monsters or chased by people. They have not experienced being captured and turned into a caged beast inside a jinchuriki. So don't be surprised if they are not as crazy or human-hating, though they will become that when we reach the canon story. Dread and fear swept everybody's hearts and minds there. The big fox just ate that magical baby. Jean, who was until now still protesting, turned silent and started crying. Why did you eat him? You can speak. You are smart. Just why? Jean asked Karama weakly. Strong prey on the weak. That's the law of the universe. Now, hand me all your cows. Karama ordered them in a threatening voice. Please, let us go. If you take our cattle, then we are as good as dead. Or just kill us all. That would be a much better fate than to slowly starve to death. The mother of Jean voiced angrily. Anger was a quick way to get over your fears sometimes, but certainly not a wise thing. Karama laughed. Ha ha ha, fine, you asked for this. Everyone closed their eyes to not know when death came to them. Hey, uh, but all of a sudden, the voice of that baby came to them once again. Gene immediately opened his eyes when he heard that and saw that Shuriken was as fine as ever. He was hanging from one of Karama's nostrils while waving one arm around. Karama felt like punching his own head after this. It was impossible to contain Shuriken if he didn't want to, but he had a much bigger problem now he needed to sneeze. Oh, triple A, A2, he faced towards the sky and sneezed. Poor Shuriken was thrown upwards as he saw what it was like above the clouds. He then looked at the sun and the beautiful sea of clouds underneath. Then he started to fall like a missile whistling down. But for Shuriken, it was all fun and games. Ah ha ha ha. Karama got nervous on the ground. Will he die if he falls from there? I remember he was fine when we first saw him, but he decided to not take his chances and catch him midair. So he adjusted himself and looked up from where Shuriken would fall. After two seconds, Shuriken became clearly visible to all of them. Karama held his hands out to catch him. 100 meters, 50 meters, he was so fast. But poor Karama miscalculated, and this leads Shuriken to fall straight on top of his furry head. Boom, ow, wow. For the first time, Karama let out an animal-like cry. A big bump swelled on top of his head. Meanwhile, Shuriken was simply sitting on his back, relaxing on the fluffy red fur. Karama looked back at Shuriken in annoyance. What kind of revenge are you taking on me today? Shuriken yawned and started making hungry signs. It was simple, he would start trying to eat whatever was closest to him. Right now, it was Karama himself. Karama turned to the villagers. You have milk for him? Yes, yes, we have some. They meekly gave it to him with no questions asked. Karama simply took one of their empty buckets, poured all the milk they gave him, and held Shuriken near the bucket. Shuriken also started directly drinking it. Boredly, Karama looked at the various villagers who were cowering in fear and feeling the uncertainty looming over their lives. Where are you going? He asked them. Across the canyon, to new lands. The village chief answered immediately, not wasting any time. Karama was a smart guy, so when his eyes fell on all the cows, he had an idea for him in his mind. If I can kidnap them and make them provide milk and food for Shiro, we will never have to worry about anything brew brew brew. A.H. Karama saw that he had dipped Shuriken too much into the milk, so he pulled him slightly back. Everyone there was secretly shocked and confused about what was happening. First, it was the blatant child abuse of a baby that did not die even after falling so high from the sky. Then there was this big scary fox beast taking care of a baby like it was a normal thing. Humans, do you want a safe land to live on? A land which will always be protected from those pest shinobi? He asked. Everyone's heads nodded automatically. Good. Then just do as I say. I will give you land to live on, and in return, you will feed Shiro here some milk. 
I and my siblings will protect you if you don't try to fight us or call us names. Okay, Krama asked slash ordered them. Uh, can we think about it? A man from the group asked. Karama showed his fangs. Can't I just eat you all and be done with it? We are definitely hostages, now the man thought, and surrendered to his fate. Karama has the innate ability to sense negative emotions, so he knew what all these people were collectively feeling. If you stay honest, I will not eat you. You will also get protection. The place you are going to is also infested with shinobi. As such, even there you can die easily. Decide fast now. Shiro is almost done drinking his milk. Everyone's eyes nearly fell out when they noticed that the little baby had really almost finished drinking the whole bucket of milk. Then, it seemed that the bucket was their hourglass. The moment it gets empty, their fate will be decided. It was now up to the village chief to decide. All others will follow, as they have done till now. A long moment of silence ensued, with only the sound of shuriken cutely gulping milk being audible. Then, the old man's brows fluttered, and he opened his eyes. We will accept your offer, great forest spirit. We will follow you and establish our village where you tell us. But you must promise us that you will keep us all safe from any harm, the village chief said with a dignified expression. Karama also knew that he shouldn't push them too much. I will keep you all safe from all except me, because if you mess with me, yes, you will eat us. Please lead the way, and I am Rakamatsu. He bowed towards Karama and introduced himself. All others followed suit and bowed. Karama, for the first time, was seeing humans actually bowing to him and giving him respect. Although there was a hint of fear, but still... Thud Kurama turned his head and saw Shuriken had fallen in the bucket as it was empty. He was now just licking it clean, a proud thing Kurama had taught him. Then follow me and be fast, Kurama ordered them and walked deeper into the forest with Shuriken sitting on his head. Pa pa pa, la la la, coo coo coo, da da da. Shuriken made cute noises from the top while patting Kurama's head as if it was a drum. His smile and positive energy were surely relaxing for the people following close behind. Kurama was using his powers to make way for them through the jungle, or else they would never be able to bring their carriages. He was still covering his tracks, though. Kurama's towering height made it very hard for them to get lost in the forest anyway. But... Poor folks didn't know that Kurama had run more than 100 kilometers before, and now it was a journey back. Being a little considerate, Kurama let them rest every now and then, but it was still going to take them too long. Just when they least expected, a voice came from the sky, Shirochan, Kurachan, where are you? It was none other than Chomei. He must have come looking for them, as they had not returned in a day. Soon. Chomei noticed the large form of Kurama and flew down to them. You are here. Why did you not return already? Chomei asked Kurama, who just sidestepped for Chomei to see the people. Seeing this horde of people, his helmet-like head shined. Kurachan, I thought you stopped eating humans. Kurama then proceeded to explain who they were and why he was bringing them along. That was all it took for Chomei to accept it. Don't fear me, little humans. I am Lucky Seven Komii. All of you, get into your carts and carriages. I will bring you all with me. Chomei excitedly told them. But, seeing they were not moving, Kurama growled. Do it. I don't have time to take ten days to get somewhere I can reach in minutes. Everyone scrambled to get onto the nearest cart. Then... Chome lifted them with his claws and flew to the camp. It took him two turns to take all the people with him. Kurama, meanwhile, was back in speed mode and leapt through the forest. In just 15 minutes, they arrived home. Currently, all the people there were on the ground, cowering in fear at seeing all the nine giant figures at the same time. Just one single Kurama was like a nightmare to them. Seeing all of them at the same time made even a few of them faint. Who are these humans? 
Why are they here? Shikaku protested angrily and even ran to kill a few. Ah, yeah. But Shuriken jumped down from Kurama's head and stopped him. Kurama explained the details then. All of us have no experience in how to raise a child. For now, he only drinks milk, but later he will need to eat. And we don't even know what a child can eat and what he can't. So what if he becomes sick because of that? Kurama used Shuriken's health as a reason because he knew no matter how angry Shikaku was with other humans, Shuriken was someone he cared for dearly. But Shikaku muttered. Yuki became the voice of reason at that moment and agreed with Kurama. Calm down, Shikaku. These humans are not shinobi for us. Even those shinobi are as easy to deal with as insects. If these humans go against us, we can wipe them out at any time. But there is no harm in trying. Do not forget what the old man had taught us. Now that the topic came to the old man, all of them turned silent. Shikaku just huffed and went away angrily. These are all my siblings. We may look like beasts, but we are far smarter than you all combined. So take my warning and never try to betray our trust or harm Shiro. If you do, Giyuki's round white eyes turned red, and it was a clear message to all. Rakamatsu kneeled at them and vowed, I vow that neither I nor any member of my village will go against you. We just want to live peacefully. Then as long as you desire it, peace is what you will get. Matatabi's feminine cold voice warned them again. Kurama was happy that all agreed with his plans. This made him truly feel like he was the leader of all siblings, like he always considered himself. So he instructed the villagers, you all may establish your village here. Use the wood from the trees around here to create your dwellings. As for the cattle, he simply waved his tails and created a quick shed and fence for the animals. Rakamatsu thanked him again. Thank you, great spirit. But what shall we name this village? Oh, oh, I know. Let's name it Milky, because they live here to give milk to Shiro. Chome once again gave one of his stupid suggestions. Bonk son, Goku smacked Chome on his helmet-like head. That sounds so dumb. This will be little Shiro's home. When he grows, he will become famous around the world. How will you feel when they call him Shuriken of the Milky Village? Humans are scum. They will make fun of him. All the villagers there kept silent. Although their species was being trash-talked right now, they silently agreed. Milky was a very bad name. And on that subject, this flying spirit should stay out of naming stuff. Still, nobody had the guts to say it out loud. Ha, huh, that's a stupid name. Great. Did it come from one of us? Jean. W-H-Y-Y-Y. All the villagers cursed the boy. Kurama's eyes fell on the boy who was ready to die to save Shiro. He couldn't say he liked the boy. He'd even kill him without thinking if he had to. But he could tolerate the boy for now. Come here, boy. Kurama called him out. Jean scaredly walked forward. Why yes, great spirit. Ha <laughs> ha, I like that. All of you will address us as great spirits from now on. Even Shuriken included, as he's not like you humans. He's above you and much better than you. Kurama boasted. Yes, Shiro is the best, aren't you? Ah. Chome flew to Shuriken and started playing with him by tossing him in his arms one by one. All the villagers were just slowly becoming numb to all the heaven-defying things that were happening in their life. Boy, what do you suggest we name your village? Kurama asked. Jean thought for a while. He looked at the white-haired and white-skinned cute shuriken. Um, does shuriken have a last name? That is Lord Dama for you. He, as well as all of us siblings, have a common last name. It is Dama. Kurama corrected him and answered. Jean nodded. Um, what about naming the village Dama too? People will call him Lord Shuriken of the Dama village. I like it. Chome of Dama. Hee <laughs> hee, that sounds good. Chome affirmed. It's settled then. You shall establish a village here and name it Dama. 
All of you lack last names, so you will take Nidama. It means the second Dhamma. Now get to work. Karama ordered them. The villagers jumped with joy and got busy. They took their tools and went to chop some trees. Meanwhile, the old village chief, Rakamatsu, sat down. So we will be like family to Lord Shuriken, Rakamatsu said, trying to make small talk with Karama. Huh, no, servants. Karama corrected him. Rakamatsu then decided to shut his mouth, or he might find his status turning lower than a servant. The day went on normally. The people tried their best to ignore the towering figures of all the tailed beasts and focused on building their new home. There was not much for now, just some simple thatched huts. They needed shelter first of all. By evening, they had erected a basic structure with a roof. The walls will be built later. They realized that with these huge powerful spirits near them, there was no way that any wild animal would dare to come here. Now it was time for dinner. A few men had gone hunting and had brought back a deer and a few more rabbits. It was enough for all of them. But it was shuriken they were supposed to take care of. So they milked some of their cows and brought the milk to him. Shuriken was currently playing between an encirclement of Aisabu, Yuki, Koko, and Matatabi. He would throw his play ball at them and they would return it. Lord Shuriken, we brought milk. The mother of Jean came with the bucket. A strange utensil for a child's drink. Put it there, we will have him drink it. Matatabi signaled with her paw to leave. Soon, Shuriken got hungry and saw the bucket. It was time to have a milk drink bath. He went ahead and drowned his head in it to drink. Ay. All of a sudden a cry came from behind Gyuki. Saiken was there with another bucket of milk in his tiny hands. How could you, Shiro? Where did you get the milk from? I thought, I thought it was my job. Saiken said sadly and heartbroken. Karama brought some humans as Saiken's servants. They will take care of his food now. Gyuki told him, but it was not enough. Saiken had decided he was going to throw a tantrum. Why? I was planning on becoming the very best milker in the world. I wanted to be the best. Now how will I? What use are my cows that I painstakingly cared for now? It seems Saiken was too much into his new job. The poor bijou had to practice a lot to not scare the cows and still get the milk out. Pat Pat, calm down, you can still milk the cows every once in a while. We've got even more cows now. Why don't you bring yours and tie them up with the rest of them? Gyuki consoled him. Sniff sniff, okay, I will do that. You wait, I will bring them here. Saiken once again left. Everyone sighed with him gone as there was finally some peace. Kokuo rested his head down and closed his eyes. It's always noisy with him and Chome around, but they keep us entertained. I swear that without them, I would have gone crazy living in this forest, Isabo added. Indeed, they are a curious bunch, always having some strange thoughts in their heads. They are kind from their hearts. Old man told us to take care of them and Isabo. Can't believe we were about to separate from each other. Maybe Shiro is a blessing to us from him. Wherever he is, Yuki said while remembering the past. Thud, 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 what now? Matatabi sighed in frustration. Stop them, stop them. Saiken's panic-filled voice came from a distance. Soon, the view of a lot of cows running towards him came. They were headed straight towards Shuriken. Where and when did he get so many cows? Koko wondered in shock. Stop them before they reach little Shiro. Yuki used his tentacles to stop many of them. The rest were stopped by Matatabi, who created a fire around them. Soon, Saiken's fat blob-like body arrived while sweating profusely. Ha, thanks. I just opened their barn door and they ran out. Saiken, I thought you only had five cows. When did you get this many? Isabu asked him. Oh, well, that was many years ago. Those cows gave birth to new babies. Then those babies got big and gave even more babies. Saiken innocently explained everything. 
He was unknowingly running a very successful animal husbandry. How many are there? Gyuki inquired. Um, 40 cows and 5 bulls. They are my life's hard work. Saiken proudly claimed while wiping off the sweat on his head with his tiny arms. Puffed. Saiken, you are hundreds of years old, and for the most of it you just spent it sleeping. Isabu reminded him. So what? I had my awakening, and I know what I want to do in my life now. I want to become the best milker ever. Yeah. Saiken announced. Yeah. Shuriken also raised his arms to cheer him up. He had finished drinking his bucket of milk. Yes, Shiro, only you believe in me. You are my favorite. Saiken picked him up and hugged him softly. In the beginning, Saiken's slimy body used to bother Shuriken a lot. But now Shuriken didn't mind because he loved all of them equally. Go to sleep already. It's night. Kurama roared from one side. Ah, uh, lazy bum. Come, Shiro. We will put these cows in a new barn. Saiken scoffed and got to work. He also got the help of Gyuki because his tentacles were as good as having a lot of arms. Slowly, days passed. The fun life of all the tailed beasts and shuriken continued. Their bond grew stronger with each passing day. Each day, shuriken would also go to make rounds of the whole new village, which wasn't much big to begin with. The people would call him Lord Shuriken and bow to him. This respect was earned by him in recent days, as he was the so-called miracle child. He had healed a number of sick or injured people. His smile and different looks made him stand out too much. Hence, the reputation. Aside from this, Shuriken was also getting his training sessions from Kurama. Shiro, just do as I do. Open your mouth and concentrate your chakra above it. Then, boom, Kurama threw a small bijadama at a mountain in the distance. Even though it was small, the destruction was huge. Wea, Shuriken cheered. Ha ha, now you try. Kurama motivated him to give it a go. Shuriken cutely opened his mouth and made a noise. Eh, th. There was no bijadama, only a large puddle of spit. Kurama's excited tails fell down in disappointment. It seems I need to teach him all the way from the complete basics. Seeing them being such lovely creatures, all the villagers realized that their fears were for nothing and that these creatures want nothing from them except equal treatment. Tailed beasts were huge, and the villagers used to listen to them talk sometimes. They realized that these creatures were real siblings and were hundreds of years old, and had even tried initially to befriend humans, but they were shunned and hunted instead. Soon, a small council of elders of the village and chief gathered in a makeshift hut. Chief, those spirits are not evil at all. They are just like us. They wanted to live in peace, but they were continuously annoyed and hunted by Shinobi. They are old and wise beings akin to gods on land. One of the elders said, the chief nodded. Yes, they are walking relics of our history. They have seen us people establish villages and then destroy them in wars. They saw the worst humanity had to offer too many times. No wonder they do not seem to trust humans. They aren't spirits. They are saints. We will call them saints from now on, understood? And we will give them the respect they deserve. As long as we act normally and don't make troubles, I'm sure they can come to like us. Everyone agreed to this decision. And hence, since that day, the people of the village stopped fearing the tailed beasts. Not completely, but still, they were trying. They slowly found out that even these mighty beings were also hungry for social interactions and to have people to talk to around them. One week later, CHOM, CHOM, Shuriken cutely called Chome. Chome, who was busy helping the villagers erect some big structures, stopped and looked back in shock. Ay, 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 Shiro, you said my name. He was on cloud nine as he heard Shuriken. Calm, calm, Shuriken repeated. It seems that's all his vocabulary allowed him. Shuriken then turned to Kurama 
and called his shortened name too, KUKU. Hey, hey, say my name. Saiken came running. Shuriken stayed silent for a while, trying to remember what Saiken's name sounded like. Emoe, he said with a slightly tilted head. And oh, that's what cows say. E-R-M Saiken. Esihen. Saiken corrected him. Sasa. Shuriken blurted with a satisfied smile and nod. He's getting smarter, it seems, Gyuki said. Sun Goku added. About time. He needs to become superior to those mindless humans soon. He will be as intelligent as apes. Nobody corrected Sun Goku there. All knew that apes were not smart creatures, but Sun Goku was a hardcore pro-ape supremacist. Jean, the little boy, had by now become a play friend of Shuriken, and he always stayed nearby him. He also tried to get Shuriken to say his name this time. He softly poked his chubby cheek and asked, Lord Shiro, say my name too, please. It's J-I-N. Shuriken stayed silent for the most part. Then, when Jean again went ahead to poke his cheek, Shuriken opened his mouth and bit his finger. Initially, Jean did not worry because he did not have teeth. But how wrong he was. Shuriken's teeth had grown out the last night. And the reason he was calling everyone's name today was to tell them his teeth were feeling itchy. But it took three seconds for Jean to understand that his finger was hurting. Then he screamed in pain. Ay, uh, it hurts. Lord Shiro, don't bite my finger off. Kurama quickly used one of his tails to tickle Shuriken to laugh and release Jean. The poor boy now had teeth mark on his finger and it was also bleeding. Seeing the blood, Shuriken immediately crawled to him. His face looked apologetic and he quickly used his unknown power to heal the injury. Then, he went ahead to patted him on the forehead as if consoling Jean. He's got teeth now. Does this mean he will also eat food along with milk? Saiken wondered loudly. I think so, Yuki muttered. Then I will have to increase the scope of my animal farm to meet Shiro's meat requirements. If he eats meat as much as he drinks milk, he will need a lot. Saiken said, Shikaku arrived then. Do you not think about anything other than your farm and keeping Shiro fed? No. Feeding him is my job and I love my job. Saiken blurted immediately. He was the most serious bijou in the camp now when it came to the well-being of Shuriken. Hmm. We will need some good and big utensils to cook the food. Also, some spices to make it taste amazing so that way Lord Shuriken will become happy. Rakamatsu slowly walked with his cane. And where can we find all this? Kurama inquired. Maybe in a bigger village with a market. Or maybe a traveling merchant caravan. We are so deep inside the forest that there is no way of reaching out to the world. We cannot buy clothes either. Rakamatsu explained to him. Kurama was a blunt person. So his ideas were also chaotic. Just tell me where all of this will can be found, and I will destroy that market and bring everything here. Yuki, as always, reasoned, No, don't do that. We don't need unnecessary trouble. We have lived in peace for a while now, and if we make trouble, they will come out to find us. Then what do you suggest? Kurama asked with disdain. Yuki looked at Rakamatsu. Village Dama is supposed to be a secluded place for Shiro, and this village will always stay that way. You people need to become self-reliant so that you can produce everything for yourself, from clothes, steel, to spices, and so on. Send a small caravan to the nearest market village. Buy all the necessary material from there, from steel forging equipment to seeds of various spices. We will help you with the construction of storehouses and buildings, so bring a year's worth of material, and by the end of this, you will become self-reliant. Remember, nobody should follow you. You know the consequences. Rakamatsu nodded. I understand, Saint Gyuki, but we do not have any money for all that. Take the gold. It's of no use to us anyway. Make a good plan and buy everything you require. Understood? You will leave tomorrow morning. Gyuki ordered him. Achoo. 
Shuriken suddenly sneezed while playing with Jean. Rakamatsu saw him and smiled. I will bring a lot of tasty sweets for Lord Shuriken. Saiken agreed. Good, bring a year's worth. The next day, Chome helped them and transported their small caravan of three bullock carts and four horses to the edge of the forest near the road. From there on they would be on their own. Although they had a few swords with them, they knew that if they were to come across a bad shinobi, they were as good as dead. Leading the caravan was Jin's mother, Fumiko. They had a long way to go as the tailed beasts had set up their camp in a very secluded place. Even though Chomei helped them, they were still many days away from their destination. But at least no wild beast would dare to attack them as there was the scent of the tailed beasts on them. After six days of traveling at a very fast pace, they arrived at an old village. This village could be called a city, except there was no such term in the world just yet. It had a thriving economy as many shinobi had gathered here to make it a base. These were shinobi that were not from big clans. Still, the administration of the big village was taken care of by a normal human lord. There, Fumiko spent one day gathering everything, from steel equipment to seeds, from weaving machines to sweets for shuriken. They also bought a few stuffed toys for Shiro and small kids in the village. After that, they paid the force toll and left the village silently without attracting any bad eyes. It sure was nerve reeking at the gates. I thought they would take all our items, one of the caravan's guarding men said. Fumiko nodded. They could have done that if I had not said that I was headed to the Uchiha clan base to sell our items. To think we have to use the names of those who destroyed our lives to save ourselves. TSK, I hope when Lord Shiro grows up he teaches all of them a lesson. Another guard said, Yes, he is such a miracle child. I am sure he will become a very great person someday and he's so kind and cute. Ah, uh, a female who was handling the bullet cart started, fawning over Shuriken. Eyes on the road. We need to return safely first. Fumiko warned them sternly, but their luck was not on their side, it seemed. On the fifth and the last day of their return journey, they found a female body floating in the river. They were resting at the back at that time. Fumiko went in and dragged the body out. The body was that of a little girl that turned out to be not dead, and so Fumiko tried to save the girl. She looked no older than 10 years old. Pressing her chest repeatedly, Fumiko was able to get water out of her lungs. But then she saw so many wounds on her body. Bring me some clothes. She ordered a man. Soon, she tied her wounds and put her on the cart to take her with them or else she might get eaten by animals there. What do you think happened to her? One of them asked in wonder. Check her clothes to see if there's something... Fumiko ordered. A girl in the caravan quickly patted the injured girl's clothes. Soon, she felt something hard and clanking. Putting her hand in, she took the items out. A -a -a -a. As Shinobi, she fell back. Their caravan stopped as soon as they all heard this. Fumiko quickly went to check and saw there were some kanai that had a seal on them. Everyone immediately recognized the seal and this lead to them becoming angry and full of rage in a second. One of them even unsheathed his sword. Kill her. She's in. Uchiha. Fumiko was also angry. After all, her husband died because of these Uchihas. Because of them, Jean didn't have a father. Because of them, they were in their current conditions. No matter how happy they were with their current lives, they could never forget all of their sorrows and suffering. She took out her knife and unmounted her horse. She then got into the carriage, ready to slit the little girl's throat. My husband died because of this clan. We were so happy before. She muttered dejectedly, bringing the knife near her neck, just touching the skin. But she had never killed a person in her life, so her hands started shaking. A small drop of blood 
came out of the girl's neck due to the wound made by Fumiko's shaking. The knife was sharp, and her mind had gone empty. Kill her, her companions shouted in rage. Whoosh, what cha doing? All of a sudden, a familiar voice arrived from behind them all. They turned back and saw a giant figure. They immediately kneeled and greeted. Saint Chome, we were going to kill that Uchiha girl. The Uchiha are the ones who destroyed our village and killed our loved ones, a man said. Oh, that's very bad, Chome exclaimed and crouched down to see inside the carriage. Hmm, did this little girl destroy your village and kill your people? Isn't she too small? Chome asked in confusion, unable to understand since when such formidable kids started to appear. Fumiko was stunned before she suddenly felt ashamed, and her whole body was now washed over in guilt. No, she did not kill anyone. We found her wounded in the river. She informed Chome. Really? Then why do you want to kill her? He asked her curiously. Because she's an Achiha, a man shouted. Chome scratched his head in confusion. So, should I also kill all humans on Earth who mistreated me and tried to hurt me? There was no answer to this question. Fumiko sat back and dropped the knife and just cried. She just cried out her anger and helplessness. Pat Pat Chome tried to console her by lightly tapping her back with his giant arms. After a few minutes, she got back on her horse. We should be ashamed of ourselves. If they are animals, we cannot become the same as them. We were about to kill a small child who had nothing to do with our tragedy. Thank you, Saint Chome. You stopped us from committing this grave sin. Chome blushed. He, I just say the truth. Oki, I will help you. I'll take the carts, and you should come on horseback at full speed. A few hours later, all were back in the village. It had started to resemble a poor poverty-stricken village now, though there was the hope of improving it someday. As soon as Chome put the carriages aside, all the tailed beasts gathered, smelling the blood. What happened? Were they attacked? I hope they didn't forget and brought candies for a little Shiro. Saiken worriedly asked, B.A.M., that should be the least of our concerns. Someone was injured. Matatabi bonked on his chonky head with her paw. Uh, yes, yes, is someone injured? He corrected his question, although his eyes were still moving around, looking for the candies. Chome nodded and explained everything he remembered, so I brought her here. Suddenly Kurama roared in anger. You fool, we will have to kill her no matter what. We only agreed to keep the normal humans here, and only those that I brought here. We will never care for a shinobi, let alone one from that cursed eye clan. But aren't we good biju now? Chome asked. We are, but we cannot keep her here. She will go back as soon as she gets better and tell her clan about us, about Shiro and his abilities. Do not underestimate their greed. If they are unable to have him, they will try to kill him, so nobody else can have him. We must keep Shiro safe until he's grown up and powerful enough. Kurama lectured Chome. He may be crazy and careless, but he was not as dumb as to trust a shinobi. Calm down, Kurama. She's just a child. We just need to make sure she does not wake up and then leave her far away. Gyuki suggested. What did you say? I am the leader here. My rules are BM. Before Kurama could complete saying it, a big fist made of sand punched his face. You bastard, you think you are better than us? It was decided before that Gyuki will be the leader. Since when did we choose you? Shikako angrily shouted at Kurama. Kurama refused to hear anything else, and all he wanted now was to fight back. I will show you why I am the leader. Kurama waved his fist towards Shikako. But Gyuki, Matatabi, Saiken, and Chome stopped them quickly. Cut it out, we're all born at the same time. Nobody is superior or a leader. The old man made us free beings. Kurama, we had done the voting, and I was elected leader. You can't just change the rules. Gyuki reminded him. 
That was decades ago. I demand another voting, right now. Karama cockily said. Fine then, let's do it. Gyuki agreed. So one by one they started saying who they wanted to vote for. It started with Karama. I vote myself, Karama said being obvious. And I too vote for myself, Gyuki also said. Next came Chomei. Um, I vote Saiken. Now there was a confused silence. Even Saiken was shocked hearing his name. And me? Really? Saiken asked, still unable to believe it. Chomei nodded. You are the one taking care of Shiro's food and well-being. You deserve it. Everyone knew that Chomei was telling the truth. Saiken was never lazy when it came to Shiro. Then the voting continued. Saiken, of course, voted for himself. Then came Kokuo. I vote Gyuki, he's level-headed. Now, it was a draw with both Saiken and Gyuki having two votes each. I vote Gyuki too. Son Goku declared. And I vote Chomei. He helped make the village while all of us were lazing around. Isabu said. This was also a shocker to most. Matatabi also announced. I vote Saiken. He's been working hard ever since Shiro came. It was a tie between Gyuki and Saiken. Only Shikaku could break it now. All eyes were on him, as he was still glaring at Kurama. Ha, huh, I vote for myself, Shikaku proudly announced. Bam, Gyuki facebombed himself. Saiken confusedly scratched his head and asked, What will happen now? Sai, well, I guess we're both leaders now. Congratulations, Gyuki told him. Saiken was very happy with this, and he started jumping. He was being given such importance for the first time in his life. Really? Awesome. I'm a leader now. He. At the same time, Kurama was enraged. Why did no one vote for me? Kokuo calmly replied. Because of the way you are acting right now. Do you think anybody will like you if you keep on being this violent? Maybe even Shiro will hate you later. Now decide what we should do with the girl. Kokuo said. Let's leave her outside the forest, Saiken suggested. Gyuki was already planning this. Yes, and let's make sure she doesn't wake up. A.H. Who are you? Where am I? All of a sudden a loud voice came from the carriage. And sure enough, what they didn't want to happen had happened. The girl was now all healed and up, courtesy of their little magical doctor. Come on, Shiro. Why? Yuki muttered in annoyance. Giu Giu, was Shuriken's reply. Ayyyyyyyyyyyyyyyyyyyyyyyyyyyyyyyyyyyyyyyyyyyyyyyyyyyyyyyyyyyyyyyyyyyyyyyyyyyyyyyyyyyyyyyyyyyyyyyyyy
That was exactly what she was eating right now. Now, to her, the next biggest mystery was this little kid in front of her. This kid that everyone gives so much respect to, and even the mighty saints shower with love. She was just told that he was special, and that he had healed her, but she was doubting if it was true. What do you want? She inquired. Aye, Shuriken opened his mouth wide. Monday through Monday looked at the dumpling she was holding. Is he asking for this? I'm sorry, but I am not allowed to go out. She told him. Triple A A A. However, Shuriken insisted. With a sigh, Monday through Monday decided to just try to throw it into his mouth. Here goes nothing. She had no idea she was a shinobi. And neither did she remember her training. But her muscle memory remembered throwing knives and kanai. She aimed at Shuriken's mouth for a few seconds and finally threw it. BAM, it was a strong throw, but the next thing she knew, Shuriken was cutely chewing on the dumpling. IT went in. Yes. She cheered for herself. Triple A. Triple A. Shuriken started asking for more. And like this, they both became friends. One week later, the noise of various tools being used resounded throughout the whole village. More and more huts had started to get erected, with bigger workshops also being constructed. A small land was cleared as well, and this area was where some villagers plowed the fields to grow some rice and vegetables. They were also making a dedicated area to grow some fruit trees, spices, and some special vegetables. A small shed was made to grow some mushrooms. Other than this, two new bigger wooden sheds were made. One where women sewed clothes, and one where men worked with their tools to produce various items they require. Because it was a very small village, it was easy to manage. The people lived in peace and happiness. There was food for all, so everyone worked their hardest and prayed to the saints while sleeping peacefully at night. Most of them were skeptical about living here at the start, but now they were happy they had stayed here. Everything was better than before, and not just that, as for some reason, all of them were also feeling very healthy. But in the whole village, there was one person who was bored and sad. It was the little ten-year-old, Monday through Monday. She still had not recovered her memories, and was still locked up inside the hut. She didn't even try to run away, and that was largely because she had no idea where she was supposed to go. Here, she was getting everything. Food, water, sleep. Also, there was her daily playmate, the weird baby. She had now made it a habit to share her food with Shuriken. She'd just throw it into his mouth from her window. He's late today. At this rate, I'll finish my breakfast. She muttered to herself. What she didn't know was that the previous night Shuriken had gotten excited about getting a new toy that the ladies of the village made for him. So he played with it till late in the night. Currently, he was sleeping happily in his little bed. Even he had a small hut now, though it only had a roof and no walls, because the tailed beasts would still make a circle around him while sleeping. Shiru wakey wakey, Saiken came to wake him up, as he had a big plate full of roasted chicken with him. He had learned this dish from a few aunties in the village. They were happy to teach the delightful and happy bijou. Shuriken had not even woken up, but his nose started twitching as if it had naturally picked the fragrance. A big smile erupted on his face, and his eyes opened wide instantly. Ah, uh, chick. He celebrated and quickly got to eating. Thankfully, Saiken had already taken out all the bones. Do you like it? Saiken asked him. Shuriken turned to Saiken with a serious face and paused, even moving. After letting Saiken be a little nervous under his gaze, he suddenly showed a thumbs up. I, uh, yes. He, he, eat as much as you want, Shiro. I will go and make sure my chickens are healthy. Saiken skipped away happily. It was funny seeing the huge, mighty beast acting like this. Y.E.W.N. Matatabi, who was also resting beside Shuriken, stretched herself. He sure is cheerful today. Saiken really found something he loves. Jealous of him? 
Perhaps you also want a farm. Kokoro teasingly asked. Matatabi scoffed. Huh, I'd rather be bored than taking care of small, mindless animals. Ma, uh, Shuriken called her loudly. Matatabi looked at him and saw he was throwing a ball towards her. It was a ball made of rubber, big in size and lightweight. As if something suddenly possessed her, Matatabi jumped to the ball and started playing with Shuriken. Kokuo sighed seeing this, and she says she needs a hobby. Her cat features are too obvious. Just then Fumiko came to him and bowed, saying, Kokuo, it's time to water the new fields. Kokuo sighed and got up. This was his and Isaba's job now. They had volunteered to irrigate the plants and the fields. Maybe I should make a lake for them and then a small canal for watering the fields about the same time. A meeting was taking place between Gyuki and the village chief. Should we release that girl now? Rakamatsu asked. It's your decision. We can catch her even if she gets her memory back and tries to run away. Don't forget, we have Chomei, who can fly much faster than any human can run, even if they were shinobi. Gyuki informed him. Rakamatsu nodded his head. Then let's release her. She's been bored in the hut anyway, and she has nowhere to go. Maybe if she stays out, she can help Lord Shiro practice. As even though she may have forgotten her powers, her body has not. Indeed, let's do this then. She will help Shiro exercise daily. But keep Jean around them. Tell him to keep an eye on her. Gyuki ordered and left. Soon, Monday through Monday, saw a few people coming towards her prison hut. She moved a few steps back in fear that they'd harm her. But they just opened the door and left. Confusion was written on her face. For a few minutes, she did not go out. But when she saw nobody was around, she slowly sneaked outside. It was true nobody was there, and even those who saw her ignored her. She turned her head and looked behind the hut. There was a dense jungle. If I run there, they will not be able to find me. She did not know what kind of place this was or what these people might do to her. Ah ha ha ha. Then the sweet melodious voice of Shuriken fell onto her ears. All of a sudden, all thoughts of leaving the place vanished from her mind. She just relaxedly put her hands behind her head and walked towards the voice of Shuriken. From a distance, the village chief and Fumiko were observing her. I guess we now have another person joining the village officially, Fumiko muttered. Soon, Monday through Monday arrived where Shuriken was playing with Jean and a few of his toys. As always, a tailed beast was near him. She had never seen Shuriken being alone in all her time here. Did they adopt him or something? She wondered. Stop right there, girl. Show me what's in your pockets. Son Goku stopped her. She scaredly overturned them, and it turned out she had a candy she had saved for Shuriken. A A A. Shuriken, as always, opened his mouth wide. Here you go. She threw it with precision. Jean enviously looked at the candy and asked Monday through Monday, Do you have more? But she shrugged. Seeing his sadness, Shuriken quickly raised his palm towards Son Goku, as if demanding some more candy. Hey, you had your fill. Don't ask for more. Son Goku denied him, but Shuriken didn't deter. Soon enough, Son Goku's heart melted. He couldn't say no to that cute face this long. Life in the village was like that every single day. Someone will argue. Someone will fight. Some feasts will be organized, and all will live happily. This was the daily routine. For Shiro, as he was growing up, each tailed beast tried to teach him their own techniques, wanting him to grow into a powerful boy in the future. But his growth was too slow. And even by the time Jean turned 10 years old and Monday through Monday, now named Minari Nidama, turned 15, Shuriken was still in his toddler phase. But at least he was developing his speech skills much quicker now. But even now when he could say full names of people, he still gave random nicknames. The tailed beasts didn't mind though, because they felt loved due to this. Over the years, 
Many shinobi would randomly stumble upon their village mistakenly while being lost. And if they tried to hurt someone, they were immediately eaten by the tailed beasts. But if they turned out to be friendly, they would still be eaten anyway. To the bijou, only Shiro and the village were the priority. All others could go to hell for all they cared. But then they felt that for some reason more and more shinobi had started to arrive at their door. They quickly found out that the seeds of war had once again expanded. And now the Uchiha clan and Senja clan were fighting around this area. Not wanting to be bothered, the tailed beast simply picked all their stuff from the houses, their crops, and everything else, after which they helped migrate to an even deeper part of the jungles. This was so far away from civilization that even if someone got lost here, they'd die of starvation before reaching the area. How long will we not fight them? This is our land as much as theirs. Shikaku annoyedly asked, We will wait for Shuriken to grow up. We don't want any unwanted attention on him. Once he's a big boy, we will fight the world to make this village world-renowned. Yuki promised him, but unknown to all of them, someone's unwanted attention had already been drawn to Shuriken. It was a strange black blob-like creature that was a master of hiding and traveled underground. What a strange baby. I've been watching him for decades now, and he still did not grow up just yet. He looks a little like Mother too. Is he from her species? But why a baby? The blob wondered. Ahaha catch me. A toddler shuriken ran around the village. Following behind him were Jean and Minari. They were surprisingly sweating heavily. Although shuriken had small legs, he was very fast somehow. One couldn't see how his legs were moving, as all they saw was a blur. Slow down, Lord Shiro, Jean shouted. He was the worst of the three, because he was an ordinary human, while unknown to Minari, she was a shinobi. Ha <laughs> ha, Kurama, pick me, Shuriken shouted as he reached the big red fox. Kurama obliged and lifted him in his hands. From there, Shuriken jumped on Kurama's back and laid down, resting on the soft fur. It was his favorite bed. He looked down at his two friends, come up, but Jean and Minari looked at Kurama in fear. As they knew, he gets angry so easily. Kurama rolled his eyes and just put them on his back. He was also resting anyway, so it does not count as riding on his back. The three sat together and started talking about senseless things. Minari was now 15, so to her, all their talks sounded too childish. Monday through Monday, show me that eye again. It's red, just like mine. Shuriken asked her. She was tired of this. Ever since she had found out that she had some weird eyes called Sharingan, Shuriken demanded to see them every once in a while. She had no idea what these eyes did though. She could just see things better and slower. Okay, but my eyes hurt after I use them. She complained. I will help then, Shuriken assured her. He always uses his healing on her eyes to lessen the pain. Yes, they do hurt less now, so I guess I'm getting used to pain. She muttered. BM, well, why did you do that? Jean all of a sudden slapped the back of her head. No, you're not getting used to pain. You are so dumb. Ha. Huh. Here, look at my eyes now. She huffed at Jean and activated her Sharingan. Shuriken marveled at how her normal eyes changed to this weird new pattern. There was a small black dot in the middle, and then two dots around it. Ah, they hurt now, Minari complained. Shuriken quickly got close to her and put his hands on her eyes. His hands then started to shine in blue color. Minari felt a cooling sensation in her eyes, and all her pain slowly went away. Yes, I feel better now, she told him. Satisfied, Shuriken moved back, but... Then he loudly exclaimed, W-O-E-H, Monday through Monday, there is one more dot now. Three dots around the middle one. Minari was shocked, but she had no idea what this meant. It had changed from one dot to two dots before two. Maybe your healing is doing this to me. That's so pretty. 
I wish I had that. Mine only look red and plain. Shuriken said with a saddened tone. Ah, you can just take it. Find another Achiha and take his eyes. Kurama spoke all of a sudden. Shuriken crawled to Kurama's head and looked down from there at his face. Kurama's big eyes stared at his face. But that's bad, right? You shouldn't steal someone's things. Eyes are too important for them, right? He innocently asked. Kurama scoffed and spat on a tree, drowning it in his saliva. But it was probably good for the tree, as his saliva was imbued with chakra. Huh, who told you that? Boy, strong rule over the weak, and if you got no strength, it's better to shut up and run away. That's the rule of nature. Look at the sky. You see that small bird? That's food for bigger birds, Kurama said. But Saiken said only bad people should be punished. Good people should be left alone. Shuriken argued. Ha, Saiken is too soft in heart. Remember, Shiro, if you aren't ruthless, then someone more ruthless will stomp you down and take away what's yours. So you must make sure you are always the one to stomp on others, not the other way around. Kurama was giving a life lesson or something he considered good. He had seen the world, the good, the bad, and the ugly. Everything was present here, but he had learned his lesson when he was small. And that lesson was that it's better to be bad and strong than good and weak. Aha. Uh -huh. Shuriken hummed and returned to play with his friends. Far away from the jungle, Hashirama clan camp. Lord Senju, I have sent 15 men into that jungle in the past two years. None of them returned, except one. He didn't see anything either, and was just running away from the mission. A man with a spiral emblem in his armor spoke. Sigh, it was a worthless move, it seems. I, I should not have trusted the words of that masked man. I thank you and the Uzumaki clan for taking this mission. As promised, I will compensate you for the lives lost. Lord Senju, currently the highest ranking member of the Senju clan, replied. After that, the man from the Uzumaki clan left. As he left, another person entered the tent. Lord Tamora, I have brought news. Haha <laughs> Butsuma, come sit with me. It seems I am going senile with this crazed war, thinking about mysteries in the forests. How are your sons? I heard another one was just born. Haha, <laughs> slow down. Butsuma, the burden of increasing our numbers is not on your shoulders alone. Lord Tamura Senju jokingly said. Please don't joke, Lord Tamura. You are not one to talk yourself, having your own six sons. Butsuma replied. Haha, <laughs> I should have known you would say this. Tell me, what news did you bring? Lord Tamura inquired. The Achiha clan is on the move. They're trying to take over villages and create a border. I'm afraid they're trying to etch their boundaries and create their own kingdom. Butsuma answered him in a warning tone. Lord Tamura's face turned grim. They are becoming too impatient. Fine. I appoint you as the rear commander. You go take some men and remind them that this war is yet to conclude. Butsuma bowed and left the tent. He immediately went to his own and found his oldest son Hashirama, who is 10 years old, and his second son Tobarama, who is 8 years old. They were practicing throwing kanai. Follow me. It's time you learn the cruelty of war. He stoically ordered them and left the tent, not even looking at his newly born third son. The same was at Uchiha village as they also prepared for various wars with the Senju clan. But, surprisingly, they had also sent a few men to search the large, mysterious forest after getting words from a masked man. None of their men came back either. They guessed that all of them were probably murdered by the Senju. Now they were preparing for a payback. Somewhere in the land always covered in mist. This land was an island with the sea around it, separating it from the mainland. The sea was also a natural defense, and the shinobi living there developed their abilities to match their environment. Not many people lived on the land, and the shinobi were also much less numbered. Boom at the outskirts of a shinobi village, a loud boom sounded. 
Something had fallen from the sky. When the shinobi gathered there, all they saw was a large crater. At the center of it was a man. He had pure white skin that was even whiter than the people from the Yuki clan. The man also had long white hair and three horns protruding out of his skull. Strange white eyes and a red tattoo were also on his face, along with some more jewelry on his body. People wondered who or what this was. He did not look like a human to them, but the clothes showed he was one. Fush a brave shinobi jumped down into the crater and asked, Who are you? How did you fall from the sky? The horn man seemed to be confused, looking at his hands. It took me too much time to land on this planet. Hey, are you deaf? Annoyed, the man suddenly caught the shinobi by his face. Tisk passed. No matter which planet it is, there are always annoying ones like you. Rejoice, for I know how to deal with pests. BM he closed his palm so strongly that the skull of the shinobi burst like a watermelon. Ha, huh, spoiled my clothes. He cursed and turned to look at all the people. He spoke calmly, yet his voice resounded everywhere. Listen to me, pests. Bring me your lord. Until he's here, I will kill one of you each passing second. As soon as he said that, he pointed his arm at a random person and blasted a small ball of white light from his palm. Boom, it completely passed through the body of the man, instantly killing him. But the energy ball traveled further and collided with the mountains, blasting them into smithereens. This was when everyone realized that this threat was real and none of them could fight it. A-A-A-A. Chaos ensued as they started running away, not even realizing their ordeal will not end unless their lord is here. Boom boom with each passing second, a new person died, and a new blast resounded. Old, young, man, woman, or children, it didn't matter as all were mercilessly being massacred. Unaware of everything that's been happening around the world, the adventures of little Shuriken were endless. But slowly as he grew up, he started to realize that he was very different from his friends. As they all grew taller than him, he stayed small. He asked Saiken, whom he sees as his nanny, why was he so small? Ah, because small is cute, Shuriken, and you are just like me, Kara, Chan, and the rest. You are made of chakra, so your body needs this pure chakra to grow. That is why it takes extra time for you to grow. Saiken told him, then, this means one day I will grow as big as you, he inquired. Saiken didn't know this, um, that is yet to be seen. I remember when I was all so small, it took me so long to grow this big. But don't worry, we can control our size, and if you grow too big, you can get smaller. No, I will grow as big as you, then we will play together. Shuriken innocently said, he we can play right now, Saiken replied and started tickling him. Five more years had gone by now. Jean was now 15, and Minari was 20. Both of them were too old to play with Shuriken, who looked like a seven-year-old kid right now, but they never left his side, as that would make him sad. The village of Dama had a makeover. Now it didn't look like a slum anymore. It was now more like a resort with ponds and lakes, pretty architecture, and tiled roofed homes. But a very strange thing has happened in the village. Some kind of mutation occurred in everybody's body there, and this made them physically super strong. For example, they could punch holes in stone walls and bend steel like it was nothing, and it was steadily increasing. The village elders and tailed beasts talked about this. The tailed beasts then checked their bodies and found that although they were still not a shinobi, their physical bodies had gotten stronger. Hell, the old village chief that seemed to be on deathbed was still alive and now even had a body that would make young men feel ashamed. He had muscles and biscuit-like abs. They hypothesized that this was because of all the tailed beasts and shuriken being around them. Because of these ten, the intensity of natural energy in the village was astronomical, which was bound to have some effect on the people. And this was the result. They guessed that as long as they keep on living like this, one day the villagers might even become stronger than shinobi, 
Minari sat near Shuriken and Jean, who were playing shogi. Fumiko had brought it for him when she had gone to buy some items from outside. She was not interested in it. Instead, she just silently looked at the sky. A smile was on her face because something had happened. She had not told anybody, though, but her memories had returned when she was 18. Minari remembered everything that happened before she came here. It was her own clan that was after her life, all because she had heard someone talking about a plan to kill the current lord of the clan and take his place. She was chased and nearly killed until she fell into the river. Then Fumiko found her. She knew that by now her real family was probably dead, killed by the same people who were after her. Did she want to go back and check? Yes. Was she dumb enough to do it? No. She had decided that this village is the place where her family is now. Besides, she loved being around Shuriken. She had also gotten stronger than before, and was even the strongest person in the village, as she is a Kunoichi. Now, her duty was to at least train the villagers so they know how to use their increased strength. Initially, they were angry at her, and she didn't know why, but later when she learned that it was the Uchiha clan that destroyed their whole village and killed many relatives, she understood their resentment. To stop this resentment, she tried her best and stayed friends with them. Now, she could proudly say that she was an integral part of the village and everyone saw her as a family. The village now has a population of 200, an increase of 50, which was acceptable. They had placed a two-child policy anyway, so that the population does not grow quicker than their ability to feed themselves. The village didn't lack anything. They had everything they needed. From all kinds of food crops to fruits, they had enough clothes, tools to make new things, and animals to fulfill all their dairy and meat needs. Other than this, they even had a lot of money, and it was all in the form of gold. Sometime in the past, they had found a small gold deposit. At the time, they just took it and turned it into coins, but they had nowhere to use them, so it was just sitting there. The villagers also had too much free time, so they were forced to find different hobbies for themselves. Some had taken painting, some sculpting, and some dancing. There was no lack of talent in the village. At the end of every month, they would hold a talent festival, and in this, all villagers will show their finest creations or talents. Some did comedy sketches, some danced, and some showed their art. The judges, of course, included the beloved Saint Beasts and Shuriken. The people of Dama Village loved the Tailed Beasts. Although some of the Tailed siblings were a little too quick to get angry, they never harmed the people. They also protected them from some shinobi who had wandered too close and even from natural disasters. To them, these saint beasts were gods. And where do gods live? In shrines. So the people with too much free time had built nine beautiful shrines around the village. Although they were too small for them to live in, they still held value. As each had a sculpture of the relative tailed beast. And people sometimes would go there to pray. Shuriken didn't get a shrine. He had a big house in the village, but he didn't live there. After all, he still loved sleeping on the back of Kurama, and sometimes on Son Goku too, as he also had fur. Talking about Son Goku, he, like the rest of the tailed beasts, had taken a job. He was responsible for growing fruits, but he'd eat most of the banana himself. Shikaku had taken the job of keeping the soil in the land fertile. He worked with Isabu and Kokoro who watered the fields. Matatabi had cat-like tendencies and liked hunting, so she sometimes brought meat to the village. Gyuki was the master strategist, and he liked constructing things which lead to him designing the whole village. He was also responsible for maintaining the building structures. Chomei could fly, so he was responsible for making sure nobody comes too close to the village. Saiken was, as all know, busy with his animal farm. Kurama was the worthless one, as he spent most of his days sleeping. He'd say he's guardian shuriken, so the rest just made him guard the whole village. 
More and more shinobi have started to come close to this village. There were 20 just this year. Why do you think this is happening? Chome was talking to Gyuki. I don't know. Maybe something has happened on the outside. Gyuki thought. Yes, the war has intensified. Now they are fighting to establish their country. Each clan wants land, and they fight for the best peace. Fumiko told them. She had gone out not long ago and learned all this. So they're trying to find more land in the jungle? Chomei wondered. Huh, that's what humans do. They destroy nature. I'll kill them all if they decide to mess with this place. Kurama scoffed from a distance. Should we move somewhere else? Chomei asked. No, not this time. We have spent so much time and resources on this place, and we won't leave it now. If they come here, we will fight back. What can they even do? Scream at us. Yuki replied. He also liked this place after all. Yes, we will fight. Chomei enthusiastically cheered. Those fools couldn't even reach the village, let alone investigate. I must find another way to check that boy. A black blob spoke to itself while being hidden in the ground. Whoosh! Suddenly, another blob appeared. It was white and expressionless. Quick, come to the land of mist. They have arrived. Who? The black blob asked. Atsutsuki. This was enough to make the black blob shiver in fear and sweat like it was going to die. But this, this is too early. It quickly disappeared from the village, leaving behind a white blob to keep an eye on everything. Shiro, look, look. My eye. Minari all of a sudden ran across half the village and came to Shuriken. Her eyes were red and blood was oozing out of them. But there's something different. Look, it changed! She exclaimed. Shuriken looked and saw a different pattern now, much different from the previous three dots. It looked very beautiful and he felt slightly jealous. It's so pretty. What does it do? A.H. You're bleeding, let me help. He quickly stopped her eyes from bleeding. Thank you, Shiro, you're the best. She gave him a sweet hug. She and Jean were the only ones allowed to call him just Shiro now. He he, thank you. Tell me, what does this I do? Is it different from before? He inquired. But Minari didn't have any idea either. I don't know. It just feels a little heavier now. Hmm, let's ask. Gyuki, he knows everything. He told me the story about how Chakra and Shinobi came into the world. But I have promised not to tell anyone. He started blabbering while walking with her and holding her hand. She was his big sister after all, even though he was decades older than her. Hmm. I think this is the upgraded version of the Sharingan. It was called something, um, Manga Sharingan? No, no. Yes. Manga Kyo Sharingan. It's a very strong eye and will make you one of the strongest people in the world. This is if you know how to use its special abilities. But it will turn you blind if you use it too much. Yuki muttered, remembering things from centuries ago. What? Minari exclaimed in shock. She will become blind. Why? Shuriken asked worriedly. Yuki shrugged. I don't know. Maybe the eye is too strong for a human body, so it damages the veins. But there is a cheat. It's called, if I remember right, Eternal Mangekyo Sharingan. I don't know how to get it though. Maybe Kurama knows he used to stay around the old man all the time. He knows more stories than me. Minari felt a sense of crisis looming on her head. No eyes. But then, Shuriken held her hand and said, Don't worry, I will heal your eyes every time you use them. This way you will never go blind. Yuki was drawing some building plans on the side. He agreed after hearing Shuriken. Shiro is right. I haven't seen anything that Shiro couldn't heal yet. Your eyes should be within his capacity too. But remember, Shiro is special. Normal shinobi can't heal it most likely. If this eye is so strong, then why haven't the Uchiha clan won the war yet? Minari inquired. Well, you are a lucky girl. I don't know how, but... Shiro was able to force that eye to come out. 
Normally, getting a Mangekyo Sharingan is very hard, and I doubt anybody in that clan has it. On top of that, their rivals are not weak either. There is a big history behind this that I can't tell you. It's a secret. Gyuki explained to her. Although interested, she kept herself from asking. But one thing was clear, she needed to find out the abilities of her eyes. Gyuki said special abilities, so there must be something good. So she started to test out her eyes, trying to find what was so special about them. In normal times, it just acted like a regular Sharingan. Shuriken tried to help her many times, so she can find out about her new abilities. There was no progress, until two years later when Jean and Minari went hunting deer. During that time, a giant snake came out of nowhere, and shockingly Jean started fighting it with his bare hands. Due to his increased strength, he was able to hold it. But the snake was too big and was slowly catching Jean in its clutches. With distress and urgency, Minari started to fight it too. After all, she was stronger than all villagers. Initially, she was successful and was able to drag Jean out of the snake's clutches. But then the snake chased after them, and Minari was annoyed by this. So she bit her lips and focused on the snake with her right eye which now had Mangekyo Sharingan activated. And just when the snake was a few feet away from them with its open mouth, all of a sudden a big beam of white light came out of her right eye. It was so fast and strong that now there was a big hole in the head of the snake, after which it fell down with a thud. But the scarier part was that the white beam of light had gone for maybe a hundred feet, burning everything in its way. There were no flames, only ashes and some smoke. Her right eye had started bleeding too. Soon, Chome, who was on patrol, arrived to see the commotion. He seemed excited that she was able to do something so cool. After that, they returned to the village and Shuriken healed her eyes, stopping the bleeding. Do you feel blind? How many fingers are these? Shuriken cutely showed her three chubby fingers. Five, she replied. Shuriken's jaw dropped. Oh no, we need to find spare eyes for you. Didn't you say we shouldn't take someone's eyes? Jean reminded him, but Shuriken countered. Yes, but that was only for good people. We need to find a bad Achiha and get his eyes. Pfft, ha ha ha. I was just kidding, Shiro. Those were three fingers, but I'm glad you care about me so much. I think as long as you are beside me, I will never get blind. She hugged him like a teddy bear. She was 22 now after all, much bigger in size than toddler shuriken. Will you show me that white light later? He asked her while still in her arms. Sure, I think there is another ability that I am yet to find. The white light only came from my right eye. I don't know what the left one will do. She wondered loudly. Hey, I fought that snake too, you know. You didn't even ask me how I was. Jean complained. But you are so strong, Jean. You even uprooted that whole big tree that day. Shuriken argued. Jean started scratched his head in shyness. He it was just a small demonstration. What did the snake look like? All of a sudden Kurama's voice came. Jean stiffened hearing this. He answered politely, Great Saint Kurama. The snake looked black. It was larger than the trees too. Kurama scoffed. Huh. Those bastards of Ryuchi Cave have become too proud. I guess I will eat some snake meat tomorrow. But Matatabi immediately stopped him. No, Kurama, don't fight them. Don't they have an abundance of natural energy in their cave? Maybe we should take Shiro there so that he can grow quicker. Kurama's ears stood up as soon as he heard that. It was a very good plan, and those snakes would not dare say no to him. Shiro, want to come with me? Kurama asked. Of course he would, as he had heard what Matatabi said. Yes. I want to grow as big as you, and then play. He hugged Kurama's paw. Kurama then just lifted him up and put him on his back, a privilege only given to Shuriken. Let's go. Kurama ran at full speed, as he also enjoyed Shuriken's happy cheering. Kurama 
was taller than all the trees in the forest, so when he ran, all the jungle could be seen. Shuriken enjoyed the view and the cold breeze on the back. Faster, faster, he happily chirped. Ryuchi Cave. The Ryuchi Cave was a very well-kept secret location. Only those who were actively trying to seek it could reach the place. Usually, only those willing to sacrifice anything in their greed for power comes to Ryuchi Cave. In order to be granted audience to learn Senjutsu with the White Snake Sage, one must pass three trials posed by the snakes. According to the rules, if a candidate fails at any of the trials, the snakes are allowed to devour them and consume their chakra. But what were some puny snakes to the mighty angry nine-tailed fox, representing the peak strength of the world? There were no tests that could hold him back. If the snakes talk about devouring people, he was big enough to devour them. Oi, slimy snakes, come out! Karama shouted at the entrance of the cave system. Rumble soon the mountain started to shake and rumble. It was obvious someone was coming out of the cave. Then, two big eyes appeared at the cave's entrance. What do you want? An annoyed voice asked. Tell your boss to come out now, or I will destroy this mountain. One of you dared to come near my home and attack my servants. Karama demanded, but the snake stayed silent for a while and replied, We can pay you in gold for your troubles. Karama was taken aback by this. You think I need gold? What am I going to do with it? Eat it. Then maybe you can take one of our virgins. I guarantee they are very smooth and long. The snake offered. FFFUU, you are all snakes. All of you are smooth and long. Karama raged. The snake seemed shocked for some reason and stutteringly replied, Ah, Tithan, perhaps you want MME. Karama felt genuinely worried about this snake's mental health now. Oi, oi, calm down, okay, I won't eat you. Now go and tell your boss that the great demon fox is here. Okay, Shuga. The snake left, leaving behind a shocked and grossed out Karama. Eh? Karama, I think that snake likes you. Shuriken noted. Karama shook his head in disappointment. That's what I'm afraid of, Shiro. That's what I'm afraid of. After a while, Karama and Shuriken were led inside the cave system. In the end, they arrived at a very large opening. It was as if they had hollowed down the mountain. Now in front of them was a huge throne on which a giant white snake sat. It was larger than Karama, but Karama had confidence that he was stronger than it. What's with that pervert snake? Karama complained. The white snake was the white snake sage, the leader of the snakes of Ryuchi Cave. She was an expert in Senjutsu. Forgive him, he's too old and has a tendency to speak nonsense. She said, shrugging on the responsibility. Karama wasn't happy. Nonsense? He was pimping your kind to me. The snake sage looked at that old snake with narrowed eyes, Go to your cave and don't come out. Now, why did you disturb me? She asked him. Karama scoffed. Huh. One of you attacked my people. His body is lying there now. TSK. Must be Rhoda. Too impatient and dumb. Well, what does it have to do with me? She said, once again shrugging her responsibility. Hey. Wait, wait. Don't do that. We can talk. What do you want? She finally got serious. That Bijadama would surely destroy her cave otherwise. Karama scoffed. Huh. I want little Shiro here to safely live and grow. The big white snake looked at the little boy on Karama's back. Shuriken also stared at her and then started laughing. Hee he so cute. You're wearing a hat. You think I'm cute? Ha ha ha. Never heard a worse joke than that. People fear me, child. She said in disbelief. Don't belittle him, he's 78 years old. Karama warned her. Is he a dwarf? She inquired. What's a dwarf? Shuriken asked curiously. People who are stuck with a small height. The white snake replied. Scaredly, Shuriken asked Karama. Am I a dwarf? No, you are just young. As long as you stay here, you will grow up. Trust me. Karama assured him, 
as he didn't want to hear him cry, or the whole cave would collapse. The white snake then got up from her seat and slowly came closer to see Shuriken. Hmm, strange. I don't feel any chakra in him. It's as if his whole body is made of natural chakra slash energy. Author's note. Consider bother natural energy and natural chakra the same. Though in the latter part, it is only called natural energy. That's why I'm here. He needs natural chakra to grow better. So we're going to stay here for a while. You got any problems? Kurama ordered in a threatening voice. No, you killed Rhoda, so his cave is empty now. You can stay there. Not like it'll get in your thick skull if I refuse, she thought to herself. Boy, do you want to learn Senjutsu? She asked Shuriken. What's that? Shuriken inquired. It's the art of using Senjutsu as your chakra. It makes you much stronger than a normal chakra user. She explained. But it confused Shuriken. Um, why? I always use natural energy. I don't have chakra. Ha ha ha. You dumb snake. Shuriken is not ordinary. Forget it. He's out of your comprehension. Let's go, Shiro. Kurama mocked her and left with him. When he was gone, the snake sage wondered about Shuriken. Hmm. Then isn't he just like the tailed beasts? After this, Shuriken's evolution started. Ryuchi Cave was filled with natural energy, and he also felt much better here. But they didn't just live there all the time. They would often return home and then come back to the cave. Slowly, eight years passed. In that time, Shuriken went through the most physical development. Now, he looks like a 12-year-old. This was significant growth for him, as he at least didn't have to look up all the time while talking to people now. He also grew a little mature. With all the tailed beasts as his mentors, he learned countless things. Shuriken was now a walking bundle of qualities of all the tailed beasts. But today, he was dressed in special clothing. He was supposed to preside over a wedding. He was the lord of the village, after all. Wearing his beautiful kimono heori, Shuriken went out to see the bride. Are you sure you want to marry him? I thought you hated each other. You fight all the time. Shuriken asked. Hee hee, but we like each other. And I always win the fights. So it's him you should be asking this. Minari answered with a chuckle. She was dressed in a beautiful traditional kimono. Her black hair was complimenting her beauty. See the image. Well, I wish you all a happy life then. He prayed for her. She gave him a hug. Thank you, now go and check if Jean is ready or not. If he isn't, then pull his ears for me. Okie! Okay. Shuriken happily hopped to another house. Jean, where are you? He loudly shouted as soon as he entered. But Jean was nowhere to be seen. Did he run away? Jean, he then looked inside the cupboard and found him. What are you doing here? Hiding. I'm a little scared, Shiro. I love her, but... Man, she's crazy sometimes. Jean complained. Shuriken rubbed his head in confusion. But you're the strongest person in the village. Physically. She can still beat me up with her Sharingan. Oh, Kamasama, what have I gotten myself into? Jean prayed. If you back down now, she will really kill you, Shuriken warned. Jean nodded. Yeah, I must take responsibility. Well, I do like her. Let's go, Shiro. Jean was ready and had worn a nice kimono. He had grown very tall now and had a heavy muscular build. He was 25 years old and Minari was 30. Both of them were also appointed as Shuriken's secret guards. From there, they headed to the wedding location, which was just a small ground near the lake. It had beautiful cherry blossom trees and looked beautiful. Unsurprisingly, as a part of the village, all the tailed beasts had also arrived. How do I look? Jean asked him. Shuriken confusedly looked at his face, like you always do. Saijin's shoulder fell. Come on, Shiro. Learn some flattery. Otherwise, how will you attract girls then? He's handsome, so girls will automatically throw themselves at him. Right, Shiro? 
Minari also arrived. The whole village was gathered there for this joyous moment. I don't want girls. I just want to grow big and play with Saiken and the rest. Shuriken said. His dream was too simple it seems. Or maybe he was just too pure. Lord Shuriken, please come here and officiate this marriage. Old Rakamatsu called him. Yes, let's do that. Grandpa Raku, how old are you by the way? Shuriken asked him. Um, I think I hit 102 this year. He he don't worry, I feel as fit as a horse. I can go on more. Rakamatsu flexed his muscles. It was really strange. Everyone in the village had gotten so strong now physically. They don't fall sick anymore, and neither are they growing old that fast. Soon, Shuriken stood on a small stage. In front of him stood Jean and Minari, both holding each other's hands. Um, you know the vows, right? Say them then. Shuriken told them. Jean and Minari looked into each other's eyes and said, I to have and to hold from this day forward, till death do us part. According to God's holy law, in the presence of the nine saints I make this vow. He he, do you two accept each other as husband and wife? Shuriken asked cheerfully. He seemed more excited than the bride and groom. Yes, Minari answered first. Yes, yes. Jean quickly followed suit as he felt his hand tighten in Minari's grip. Shuriken nodded. Then I declare you husband and wife. Now kiss. Both of them moved closer slightly and kissed softly. But then suddenly Minari put her hand behind Jin's head and squeezed him closer. Come on, not here, Minari. We're going to have the rest of our lives for that. Jean whispered at his impulsive, newly appointed wife. Realizing... She let him go and smiled embarrassingly. Woohoo, it's party time. Start the music. Chome flew in the air and started dancing around and throwing some cherry blossom leaves at the people. Some villagers good at music started playing and singing. The whole mood turned delightful. Shuriken also danced around all the tailed beasts, sometimes even climbing them and dancing on their heads. The best dancer turned out to be none other than Son Goku. He was just too energetic, though he fell many times because the branches he was swinging on broke down often. Meanwhile, Saiken was distributing the cake he had made with his own little hands. The cake was gigantic. The celebrations went on for the whole day and the whole night. The people constantly prayed to the tailed beasts too, thanking them for giving them this great new life. And for the first time, the tailed beasts felt so much loved by the people who used to curse them not long ago. But this happiness had been jinxed by someone's bad eyes by now. For how long will their lives be this peaceful? Because the humans kept on expanding and were now reaching too close to their small village. The seeds of war had sprouted and now threatened to spread faster than one could have imagined. I am a bijou, I am the best. If you mess with me, I will kill you. I love my cows, but pigs are stinky. But Shira likes their taste, so I feed them to make them chonky. La 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 lea. Saiken was singing some messed up songs, but his cute voice gave the illusion that it was something positive. He was on his farm, milking the cows. Hee <laughs> hee, today I'll make my newest creation. Ice cream, he decided. He had the water release ability, so it was easy for him to make ice. The village was at relative peace. The stupid wars of men didn't have much effect on their lives. Shuriken continued to visit the Ryuchi cave and breath in natural energy so he can continue to grow. He still looked too young right now along with his pretty face. Shuriken wanted to build some muscles and look a little manlier. And the way Minari made him dress up didn't help either. Author's note. Don't worry, he will stop looking so girly soon. Though he will keep long hair, just like in the cover. Shiro, come here. The white snake sage called Shuriken as he was heading out to return to the village. He had struck up a very good friendship with all the snakes here. Although he had to first defeat them all. All except white snake sage. She refused to fight, stating that she's lazy. But Shuriken doubted that she was unsure if she'd win. 
He went to her. What's the matter, Auntie Snake? Hey, I told you not to call me that. Call me Snake Sage. Seriously, I'm not even a human. She complained. Neither am I, Shuriken replied cheekily. After a few seconds of awkward silence, she spoke. Asterisk cough, asterisk yes. I called you because I have an offer. You have been learning how to use natural energy from me for the past few years. Although you are made of it, I taught you how to use it properly. Something those tailed beasts couldn't. This was true. Shuriken was physically very strong, but he had no understanding of how to use his natural energy. The tailed beasts couldn't help him, as to them it came naturally. But Snake Sage had years of experience in teaching people how to channel natural energy. Now, Shuriken was able to learn everything from the tailed beast. And as he was fully made of natural energy, he had no specific affinity. In other words, he had all affinities. He could produce any kind of element. It confused everyone how he was able to do it though. And what do you want? Shuriken asked her. I got a sword. I had sealed a snake in it. He was very troublesome and used to be not serious about anything. I want you to tame him as he doesn't even listen to me. I think only you can do it. She asked him. Her reasoning was that Shuriken should be able to scare that snake away with so many tailed beasts around. Is that it? Give it to me. I will try to make friends with him, he agreed. Snake Sage threw a sheathed sword at Shuriken. Be warned, Shuriken. He may be harmless to you, but his voice can be heard around, and his language is not very decent. Why isn't he speaking right now? Shuriken inquired while looking at the sword. It had a snake-like pattern around its hilt. Boy, I'm assessing you to see if you're even worthy of touching this mighty snake. A hiss. A voice immediately came from the sword. It sounded mature and deep, with a hint of cockiness. What is your name? Shuriken kindly asked. He was a well-mannered kid, after all. Huh. This snake does not deem you worthy of knowing my name. The sword voiced. Shuriken confusedly scratched his head. Just name him whatever you want. He's worthless anyway. Snake Sage suggested. Hmm, then, what should I name it? How about Chun Chun Maru? He thought. Snake Sage shrugged. Whatever you want. I'd even call it Chin Chin if needed. He he, that's bad. I can't name my sword penis. Shuriken embarrassingly laughed. All the while the sword was getting hot in anger. You old H-A-G, and you stupid brat, both of you suck at naming. Shuriken calmly put the sword on the ground. Then I don't need you. I'm sure Gyuki can make me a new and better sword. Snake Sage sighed. Ah, so I guess I'll have to melt the sword and kill the snake with it. Too bad I expected him to change. Immediately the snake in the sword calmed down. He needed to get out of this cave which was the only way to get away from death. Ahaha, I was just kidding. What a cute child you are, boy. My name is Tenken. The sword introduced itself. Puffed. Heavenly punishment? Isn't this name a waste on you? Can you even cut a leaf? Snake Sage mocked him, but he sucked it all up silently. Shuriken was happy. That's so cool. My name is Shuriken. Our names rhyme with each other. Shuriken and Tenken. Let's go. I will show you to my friends. Son Goku will like you, I assure you. Bye bye, Snake Auntie. He waved his hand and left the cave. Snake Sage just sighed, not even bothering to correct him anymore. Shuriken ran at full speed across the jungle, jumping from one tree to another. He was so fast that there wasn't even a blur. Only Minari was able to track him vaguely with her Sharingan. Other than that, he was a very fast boy. Ha ha ha. Freedom. Yeah, boy. The sword was constantly laughing since they came out of the cave. Boy, I have decided to take you under my wing now. As long as you listen to me, you can get my powers. Yes, I can make you very strong. The sword tried to woo Shuriken. Shuriken suddenly stopped. Huh? Why would I follow you? 
You are just a sword. I am a very powerful sword. I am the great heavenly punishment snake. All of a sudden Shuriken just put the sword on the ground and walked a few steps further. If you are so strong, then come to me by walking, he demanded. There was a moment of silence as the jungle breeze flew between them and some crows in the sky were cawing as if mocking the stupidity that was being shown here. The sound of leaves was there to remind time was still moving. Despite the lack of words, the message was clear that Tenken had messed up. After waiting for a few minutes, Shuriken again picked it up. See, you are nothing without me. Also, don't you know me? Who are you then? I only saw you today. That old hag had locked me in her treasure chest all this time. He asked back. Um, I am the lord of Dama Village, Shuriken said and again started running. Huh, what Dama Village? Haven't heard of it before. And what is this weird name, Dama? Once again, the poison tongue of Tenken lashed out. But it was bad luck for him. Because when he made this comment, Shuriken had just arrived at the village. Hmm, who dares to mock our last name? All the tailed beasts ragefully asked and gathered. The sword all of a sudden started to shiver and sweat. It was unknown how this phenomenon was even possible. The thick aura of all the tailed beasts combined was enough to scare anybody. What was a sealed snake in front of that? Shuriken happily showed them the sword. Karama look. Ani Snake gave me this sword. She said she had sealed a naughty snake in it. I need to tame it so that I can use it on my enemies. Karama, with interest, looked at the sword that Shuriken had just placed on the ground for all to admire. How? Oh, is that so? So, this sword is some big shot? Some powerful artifact? It looks weak to me. Asterisk scratch asterisk. Karama slowly rubbed his claw on the sword. Ay, 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 ay. Don't violate me. I am ready to do whatever you want, oh mighty fox. Tenken started cowering in fear. Wasn't it you who said Dama is a bad name? Karama asked monotonously. The sword shivered. No, no. Dama is the greatest name on the entire earth and heavens. Ha <laughs> ha. Dama is the best. My name is the worst. Yes, call me whatever you want. Chun Chunmaru Chin Chin, anything will do. I am a good snake, kind big fox. Shuriken seemed disappointed. H-E-Y, why are you being such a wuss? Be strong, or I won't take you with me. I don't want to be made fun of because of a scared sword. Boy, what are you doing? Quickly bow down to these mighty beings. Tenken shouted at Shuriken. Scratch, Aya. Don't kill me. I'm just a little harmless snake. Karama scoffed. Shuriken is our boy. We have nurtured him since he was a baby. You dare to disrespect him. That kid. He didn't tell me. He's doing it on purpose, right? He. I did not know, master. I swear on my dear slimy snake life. Master, no. You are a lord. Lord Shuriken. Please forgive this humble servant. Save my life. Please, if Tenken had a body, he would probably be prostrating right now. But Shuriken was a kind boy and Tenken hadn't even done anything. He was just a loudmouth. Okay, but don't talk bad about people of this village ever. They are my dear family. Or I will leave you back at the cave. Shuriken warned him. Yes, yes, as Lord Shuriken says. Hooray, praise the Lord. You're the best. Tenken could only lick Shuriken's feet to save himself, as the tailed beasts were glaring at him. Yuki then nodded. Good, Shiro. You should start practicing sword fighting now. Minari should be able to help. Remember, as much as your chakra training is important, your jutsu and physical training are just as important. Because someone without too much chakra and a lot of experience can still win over someone with no experience and too much chakra. I understand, Gyuki. I will start right now. Let's go. Tenken, we will practice. He took the sword with him. Will it be safe? Saiken worriedly asked. 
He didn't trust snakes much. Karama nodded. I checked the seal over it. It's unbreakable by any normal means. And the snake sealed isn't that powerful either. At least not by Shiro's standards. Phew. So there's no need to worry now. I'm off to my farm then. Saiken left. And I'm off to patrol from the sky. Chomei flew away. One by one, each tailed beast left to do their assigned job. Be gentle, my lord. This is my first time. I'm trying to, but you are too weak. This is my normal speed. Shuriken replied, No, no, I'm not weak. I just don't want my shine to go away, Tenken said. He was still being docile right now, knowing his life was on the line for saying just one wrong word. Then I will get you polished later. Let me practice in peace now. Don't disturb me. Shuriken ordered the sword and continued to swing it in the air. He was told to repeat left strike, right strike, and top down strike one million times so that his body gets accustomed to using a blade. After that, he started yeah. meticulously practicing. Why are you even practicing? Aren't you supposed to be entirely made of natural energy? That's the craziest thing I have ever heard in my life. And if I had not seen you, I wouldn't have believed you. Tenkin star Ted. Shuriken stopped. Well, Krama told me that natural energy is the energy of nature, which is everywhere. That is where he and the others take energy from. Their bodies automatically convert natural energy into chakra. But although they can sense natural energy, they cannot use it. While I can't even use Senjutsu, since it is a combination of normal chakra and natural energy, what even am I? He looked at his palm in confusion and impatience. He looked different from people too. His skin was too white, his hair was white, and he had this ability to heal anything. Tenken sighed. Kid, you are special. You are the most special person in this bloody world. I've heard stories of the Great War in the past. Who knows how true they are, but since you say the beasts told you, then it must be real. And if they say they have never seen someone like you, then you are special. Come on, people are able to become godly powerful by just knowing how to sense the natural energy and use it slowly. Now imagine what you can do who is in reality a master of natural energy. Kid, the sky is the limit. Come. Don't cry about pointless things now. Use me all you want today, I'm all yours. Why do you talk so strangely? I feel weird hearing it. Shuriken complained. Ha, hey, it's not my fault. Try living for a hundred years locked in a box under that old hag slimy snake ass. Even you will become weird. Tenken replied distastefully. Shuriken chuckled. Hehe, <laughs> you are funny. Okay, let's practice. The same evening. You still think you can order me? Saiken and Gyuki are the leaders among us, not you. Shikaku roared. Sit down, raccoon. I was just suggesting to you, not ordering. I always sound like this. Kurama tried not to get too angry. He wanted to be elected as a leader too, after all. I know you, you're trying to get elected. Your intentions are clear on your face. Do you think I'm afraid of you? Huh. I can beat you right now. Shikaka growled, standing tall and ready to fight. But then he calmed down. Asterisks, I asterisk, I promise, Shiro, I would not fight. But I'm going away now. I need to calm down from this headache of being near you. Go where? Saiken asked him. To the desert, my natural home. Shikako answered and turned to leave. Whoosh, Shuriken jumped in front of him, just returning from practicing. And no, don't go, Shikaku. Seeing Shuriken, Shikaku calmed down. Shiro, I will come back soon. Don't worry. I also want to see the desert. It's been decades since I've been there. Shuriken's face fell. He knew he shouldn't force Shikaku to stay as all had their own free will. However, he didn't feel like letting him go away. He loved them like his family. He didn't want them to leave ever. He jumped and hugged Shikaka's face. Promise? Haha ha, yes, Shiro. Promise. How can I break my words to you? Shikaku lightly hugged him by patting his back with his finger. It was hard to imagine them being so close, as Shikaku 
was the one against letting Shuriken stay in the camp at the start. Now, he saw Shuriken as his dear family. Bye bye then, Shiro. Take care of yourself. Make sure that you practice regularly and become strong enough to even beat that stupid fox later. Shikaku cheered him on. Hehe, <laughs> that means I will also beat you too, Shuriken crestfallen replied. Then it would be a fair win. See you soon. Shikaku walked away while waving his hand. Take care, Shuchan. Chomei and Saiken shouted for him. The two were the only ones who gave small names to every person. But as soon as Shikaku disappeared from their vision, all tailed beasts turned to Kurama and said, You better pray he comes back. What did I do? I was just suggesting that he move his sleeping location away. He snores a lot. Kurama tried to defend himself, but nobody forgave him this time. Shuriken sadly went to his home instead of sleeping near the beasts. He was not in the mood to play anymore today, but thankfully Minari and Jean were there to accompany him. One year later, Shikaku still hasn't returned. What if something bad happened to him? Shuriken worriedly walked back and forth. His anxiety was growing with every single passing day. We're immortal. He'll be fine. Gyuki consoled him. But Shuriken refuted. You said it can take decades for a tailed beast to return back to life. I don't want to be away from my family for so long. I shouldn't have let him go. Minari and Jean came to calm him down. Minari then suggested, Shiro, I will go out to look for him. He's a giant saint. It shouldn't be too hard to find him. No, I will go. Kurama got up. What's with the look? He went away because of me. I should be the one to bring him back. He made a promise to Shiro after all. Kurama clarified. He didn't want to live with the guilt of making Shuriken sad. I will go with you. Shuriken jumped on Kurama's back. But Kurama disagreed. Yuki, hold him here. He's too weak to go out there, and he'll stick out like a sore thumb. Yuki's tentacles quickly held Shuriken. He agreed with Kurama that this was not the right time to let Shuriken out. No, I will go too. What if Kurama doesn't come back either? Shuriken tried to fight the tentacles. Calm down, Shiro. You're a big boy. Learn to control your emotions. I will bring him back, you don't have to worry about that. Until then, eat good and become strong. Kurama spoke in his heavy voice. He was talking as if teaching him. Shuriken nodded, silently, albeit unwillingly. If you don't return then, I will come Tio find you. Haha, <laughs> I will not stop you. Goodbye until then. Kurama dashed away at full speed, not looking back, as he didn't want to see sad faces. Everyone was in a sad mood today. Saiken, disheartened, muttered. Now we're just seven Bija left. I hope they return soon. The family feels small without them. Pat Pat son, Goku patted him. Don't be depressed, it's Kurama. No human can harm him. He will return. And no matter what we say, it is indeed a fact that he's stronger than us. But I'm never going to accept this fact. He he true or else it'll get into his head, and he will become even more lazy and grumpy. Matatabi chuckled. Then she turned to Shuriken. Follow me, Shiro. Today I will teach you the fireball technique. She offered him and walked to the training field. Shuriken reluctantly followed her with a heavy heart. Author's note, man, Naruto world is too confusing. Chakra is so confusing. I tried to study and this is what I learned. Had to make some assumptions due to lack of data. 1. Humans gained chakra because of Hagoromo as he spread Ninshu. 2. Only Atsutsuki used to have chakra, but Hagoromo pissed on them and gave it as gifts to all. 3. Natural energy is energy present everywhere, on every planet. It can be harvested by the god tree which concentrates all that natural energy in a chakra fruit. This means that the end result of chakra fruit is more chakra and not natural energy. For Atsutsuki clan does not know how to use natural energy because the chakra fruit 
they consume only as chakra. If they did know, they would not need chakra fruits. They are this powerful because of their constant evolution from eating literal life out of various planets. They also have biological hereditary abilities, the most common being Byakugan. 5. Senjutsu is the combination of normal chakra and natural energy. Not many can use it as it's very hard to master. 6. Tailed beasts are made of chakra, but the reason for their immortality and infinite chakra is that their body automatically converts natural energy. Also, they can sense the natural chakra since they all came from ten tails, which itself is made of natural energy. 7. This means that, so far, the only beings in this FIC that are known to be made of natural chakra are ten tails and shuriken. Now you can imagine why he will be like a juicy candy for many people, both humans and aliens. 8. Shuriken can literally do anything. He can use all elements and inyang, he can perform any jutsu. He can have various kekiai genkai, kekiai tota, and kekiai mora. If he studies enough, he can eventually make truth-seeking balls as well, since they are nothing but black orbs comprising the power of all five elements and inyang. As said in the chapter, the sky is the limit. But remember, the Atsutsuki clan had thousands of years to get this strong. Shuriken does not have that much time. 9. People who cannot sense natural energy cannot sense Shuriken's presence if he's not standing within their eyesight. 10. Kishimoto's godly writing has left many plot holes in terms of the ages of characters and the power structure of Naruto world. Sometimes they are very inconsistent. I still have no idea what Six Path Chakra is, and it's not even explained. Clank, you've grown fast and skilled, Minari praised. Clank, you taught me, Shuriken replied. Both of them were in the midst of practicing. They were fighting at lightning speed, so fast that normal eyes couldn't even see them. But Minari was able to keep up with her Sharingan. She wouldn't have been able to keep up physically, though, if not for her being a villager of Dama. At the moment, the 250 residents of Dama Village were powerful as hell. The second best of them, which were the guard of the village, could lift up to 1,000 ton weight while running from tree to tree like a shinobi. Their punches could literally destroy the skulls of even an average Jounin. But still, they were not powerful when fully put in comparison with a shinobi. This was just their physical strength. They would still fall off the trees if they stopped jumping, they could still drown in water, and they could still die from a good fire jutsu. But as far as it came to keeping the village safe, Dama Village could be considered among the best. Even the normal Joe of Dama Village could lift at least 100 tons. Hell, the 100 plus years old village chief could lift 900 tons. Shuriken and the tailed beasts were dumbfounded by this development. Now, even the new kids that were being born were having an even stronger body. In the eyes of all the tailed beasts, Shuriken seemed exactly like their old man, who spread the Ninshu and started the ninja world. They felt that Shuriken was also onto something, albeit unknowingly. But the best of the best in the village were Minari and Jean. Of course, Minari was obvious. With her previous training, eyes, and new physique, she was at the top from the start. Jean had actually worked hard to reach this position. He was the only person in the village who could lift a total weight of 1,700 tons, and he was still trying to get stronger. Here it goes, Shiro. Light of Doom. Unmiai no Hikari. Minari activated her Mangekyo Sharingan and sent her special attack, a white laser from her right eye. It was a deadly attack. A fire so pure and strong it didn't leave anything behind. Shuriken surprisingly didn't move away from the attack. He sheathed his sword and stood in front of the oncoming laser to stop it with his bare hands. Boom it smashed onto his arms that he was using to block the laser. But the momentum was too strong and he was being pushed back, his feet sliding on the ground. On top of that, the white laser was so hot. His body had already started to get red, and the upper clothes of his loose hakama 
had already burned away. Eech, it's too hot, my arm is burning. But I can take it. No, I can't take it. Shuriken jumped to the side and let the white laser destroy a part of a mountain. They chose to train here specifically so they don't destroy the trees. With a heavy breath, Shuriken laid down on the ground. His sheathed sword was still in his hand. He could have let that laser burn his arm, and it would have healed in no time. He was practically immortal, but it did hurt a lot, and he was not used to enduring so much pain. The tailed beasts never let him feel that kind of pain. This was by far the only attack by which he felt hurt him. Everything else was easy for him. Smiling, Minari sat down on a tree branch near him. Are you okay, Shiro? Ha, huh. yeah, just a minute. That white light from your eye, it's the hottest fire I have ever faced. I doubt there is anything like that in the world. Shuriken said. Whoosh Minari jumped down from the tree and used her handkerchief to clean his dirty face. Well, it has gotten stronger the more I used it. It doesn't even hurt much now. Thanks to your constant healing. He <laughs> he happy to hear that. I wish Kurama and Shikaku were here to see us get so strong. It's been two years since Kurama left, and three since Shikaka. Even Fumiko didn't hear anything in the villages outside. I need to go out and find them, he decided. But what about this village, she asked. This village is my home, my family. I am just going out to find them. And as soon as I get them, I will return, he sternly replied. Then I will go with you, she stated and her tone was not that of someone asking. Of course you will. I don't know anything about the rest of the world. All I know is what I heard from my family, Bijou. Shuriken replied, I won't hear a no, I will come. Uh, you agreed. I thought I would need to convince you. She muttered embarrassingly. Shuriken got up and patted himself clean. Let's go back to the village. Whoever reaches last has to do ten backflips in the middle of the village without telling anybody the reason. Whoosh, hey, that's unfair. You took a head start. Minari complained and chased after him. That evening, Minari had to do the backflips, but everyone knew Shuriken must have made her do it, so they all just laughed seeing it. After that, Shuriken decided to tell the tailed beasts that he was going out to find Kurama and Shikaku. I will find them, I'm sure. He firmly assured them. All the tailed beasts stood around him in a circle. They looked worried, and yet couldn't refute what he was saying. It was indeed strange that Kurama and Shikaku had not returned by now. I will go with you! Saiken worriedly walked to Shuriken and picked him in his tiny hand. Shuriken hugged the big slug. No, Saiken, none of you can come with me. Do you really think I can keep you all a secret? Also, while your chakra is traceable, Mine cannot be traced by anybody. Besides, Minari will be going with me. They all looked at the young girl. She had indeed won the trust of all the tailed beasts there. She may have been from the Uchiha clan in the past, but now she is from Dama village. I will go too then, Jean spoke up. How could he let Shiro and his wife go alone? But Minari stopped him. No, this village needs you more. You are the strongest human in here. Shuriken clapped. Then it's decided. I will leave tomorrow morning. Aunt Fumiko, do you know anything about what's going on outside? We haven't had an accident of a shinobi coming too close to here for the past whole year. Fumiko nodded and started telling them everything she knew that had transpired outside. The flames of war have cooled down. Truces have been agreed upon. And now... Those who were enemies stand together to create villages and countries. Countries are ruled by non-shinobi daimyo. Daimyo is the leader or lord of a country's non-shinobi population. All the shinobi, however, have established their own small villages, where the majority of shinobi live. They have their own leader, who is the strongest person in the whole village. Of course, they say these shinobi villages work under the daimyo, but all know that these villages have the power to take over the country anytime. Daimyo is just there for name and to take care of normal people. 
I do not know how many countries there are, nor do I know how many shinobi villages there are, but I know that we are currently inside the country of fire. Uchiha and Senju clans have come together to form a village that they have named Kanoha. Strange, I know. The greatest enemies have somehow come together. But Kanoha is also the best bet if you want to start looking for Kurama and Shikaku. I went outside nine months ago. I don't know what has changed since then. She briefed everyone about everything she knew. All the tailed beasts, in fact, felt very happy. Matatabi remarked, Finally, humans have started to grow some intelligence. Shuriken felt excited slightly. I want to see this Kanoha village. Aunt Fumiko, do you have this country's money? She shook her head. No, I never felt the need to take it. I always traded in gold, and I've never been there. But perhaps you can get gold changed for their currency from Kanoha's administration. Shuriken nodded. Minari, let's get ready. We will leave early tomorrow morning. Chomei will drop us near the main road with horses. She immediately got up and grabbed Jin's ear. She started to drag him. Let's go, my dear husband. Let me say goodbye to you before I leave. Shuriken, with a tilted head, turned to Saiken and asked, What does she mean by goodbye? Can't she say it here? Oh, she just wants to fuck. A mum. Yuki had covered Saiken's mouth with tentacles before he did any more damage. It's nothing, Shiro. She's just emotional, as she's going away from him for the first time. Aren't I right, Fumiko? Gyuki played a safe move. Why are you passing it to me? Fumiko cursed in her head. Yes, yes, Lord Shuriken. She's just saying a special goodbye to my son. She replied. Shuriken scratched his head in confusion. Then, I also want to say a special goodbye to everyone. Can you teach me? A.H. I made it worse, she now cursed herself, meanwhile. All the tailed beasts were slowly sliding away. It's late night, Lord Shuriken. Perhaps we should go and start packing. Don't you want to take your favorite dumplings on the way? Let's go and cook them. She bribed him with the name of his favorite food. Dumplings? Shuriken's mouth started watering. Okay, let's go. I will learn the special goodbye tomorrow. He happily skipped to the royal kitchen. Poor Lord Shuriken, he was taught about all kinds of jutsu, but nobody taught him sex education. Fumiko sympathized with the pure boy. Ah, I feel so sore today. I think we overdid it last night. Minari muttered as she walked out of her room, all dressed up to leave. She had dyed her hair different and wore a different dress to look normal. But... She was so pretty that even now she would attract unwanted attention. Sore? Are you hurt, Minari? Shuriken asked all of a sudden. It was a curse for the villagers that he always appeared behind them at the worst timing. And even worse was that he could not be sensed even by her. Yes, I think I strained a muscle yesterday. Don't worry, I will get better. Let's go and check our stuff. Kanoha is not close to here. We will have to travel for a few days. She suggested and walked away to find Fumiko, her mother-in-law. Is Jean not up? Shuriken asked. She shook her head, but her cheeks turned red. No, he's still sleeping. He said he got very tired of exercising yesterday. Don't worry, he will come to see us off soon. Have you packed everything? Shuriken joyfully told her what he had packed. So I made dumplings with Aunt Fumiko yesterday. I made so many that we can eat them for days. I hope this Kanoha has tasty food. She patted his shoulder. I'm sure there will be. Shinobi villages are probably the richest ones. So there should be people willing to spend money on tasty food. But did you only pack food? What about clothes? Ah, uh, I forgot. I will quickly put them in the bag, don't worry. He smacked himself on the forehead for forgetting such an important part. He was physically a 13-year-old at this point. His height was 5 inch 5, and there were ample muscles on his body. Baby fat had started to go away slowly, and a well-defined handsome face was appearing. They came to Shuriken's residence. 
It was pretty big with small ponds, gardens, a meeting room, lots of other rooms, a big kitchen, and one big room to just eat. All the tailed beasts had gathered outside his house to make sure he had everything before leaving. Shiro, did you pack the milk? No. Here. Saiken passed him a big sack made of sheepskin. It was a good container for liquids, but it was too big, at least containing 200 liters. Isn't this too much? He asked. Easy. Just use the enclosing jutsu and seal your items in a scroll, Isabu suggested. Of course, Shuriken knew this jutsu. Shikako had taught him that as he was very good at sealing jutsu. Okay. Shuriken took many scrolls and started to seal his luggage in them. In an hour, he now had a big backpack, but it was fully filled with scrolls, though he did not put all the money in the scrolls. Minari ready? He asked her. She also had a bag on her back. Let's go. Jean, take care of mother and the village. Yeah, yeah, you don't need to lecture me now. Just come back quick, he replied with a longing face. Shuriken, meanwhile, said his goodbyes to all the tailed beasts. I will miss you all. He one by one hugged their faces. They were his beloved family, after all. The tailed beasts also felt sad. They have been watching over him for so many years. Ever since he was so small, he couldn't even crawl. Come back quick, Shiro. I will be waiting for you or else my farm's products will go to waste. Sarkin requested. He chuckled. Yes, I will try to find Kurama and Shikako as soon as possible. Maybe you all can punish them later for being so late. Hehe, <laughs> we can do that. They will get a good beating soon. Chome chuckled. He had already started to plan. Cough, we should head out, or we won't reach the nearest village before night. Minari reminded him. He nodded and looked at the village people that had gathered there. Everyone be good, okay? I will come back soon. Then we will hold a big festival here. Everyone cheered for him there and wished him good luck. Chome, let's go. Shuriken turned to the seven tails. He and Minari jumped to sit on the helmet-like skull of Chome, while Chome held two horses in his many hands. The reason they were taking horses was so people wouldn't think they were shinobi at first sight. They could have been faster than the horses on their feet, though. But only Shuriken had unlimited energy. Bye-bye, everyone. Love you all. He shouted his goodbye from the sky. All the tailed beasts down there waved their hands. Asterisk sniff asterisk our little Shiro has grown so big. He's finally going out on his own. Saiken sounded as if he was crying. Son Goku patted his back. Yes, but going out is important. Did you forget how naive we used to be when we were small? Only when we saw the real face of the world did we understand things. Besides, Shiro reminds me of the old man a lot. Maybe he will do something great. Of course he's our Shiro. He's bound to do something great. His body has so much potential that it would probably make even the old man envy him. He just needs to learn to harness that potential. Yuki commented while seeing the disappearing figure of Chomei in the sky. Chomei took Shuriken and Minari towards the edge of the forest. He did not take them directly near a village, as he was too big and could be seen from a distance. At least five kilometers before the edge of the forest, he dropped them. Shiro, here, take this whistle. I got this from my shrine. Someone put it there as an offering to me. I'm too big to blow it. But when you return, just use the whistle and I will come here to pick you up. Okay. Chomei said while handing it to him. Shuriken carefully tied it with a chain he was wearing. Okay, I will go now, Chomei. Take care of yourself. He and Minari both gave Chomei a hug, got onto their horses, and trotted away. Chomei kept on watching them until they disappeared from his vision and then finally returned to the village. Shuriken was already missing them. I feel heavy in my heart for some reason. Minari smiled and said, Don't worry, we will find Kurama and Shikaku and return soon. Even if someone caught them somehow, where can they hide such giant beings? 
Shuriken agreed and tightened his fist. Yes, but if someone did hurt them, I will beat them and teach them a lesson. Ah, you look cute when angry. You love them so much. She fawned over his cuteness. Of course I love them. They are my family, my parents, and my friends. For them, I do anything. For you too, as the whole village is my family. Shuriken resolutely said. They kept on talking about family, funny incidents, and how he was nearly named Poopy. They had a long way to go. Their journey was very smooth, and they reached a small village called Okuraha. It was a medium-sized village, with mostly normal people living. It had a population of 3,000 people. But, because it was on the way to Konoha, many travelers would pass by and also rest here. They too went to a rest house. It was recommended by Fumiko, as she had stayed here before. They just talked to the owner and got rooms. They even exchanged some money from the owner in return for gold. Should we start asking about Kurama and Shikaku? Shuriken asked as they sat in their room. Minari denied. No, not the way you want to. We cannot just ask them, have you seen a giant fox named Kurama? Instead, just try to ask them what's going on around the country. If it's anything big, they will know. St. Kurama is very tall. Anything related to him cannot be a small matter. Shuriken understood. He then got up and went downstairs with Minari to eat dinner. It was a small kitchen with a few tables. They purposefully took seats near where the owner was cooking. The place was also empty. Uncle, what's the news these days? We just came out of our village and not many travelers go there. So we don't get any news. Minari asked politely after ordering food. The middle-aged man replied while cooking. Oh, not much. Just the usual business. The shinobi are still a pain. They are still fighting around. But trouble rarely comes here. I heard some big fight erupted in the shinobi village Kanoha though. But don't know what really happened. News from there is always vague. But what does it have to do with us common people? The further away we stay from that village the better for our lives. Yes, that's right. Only troubles come from meeting shinobi. Their business is never simple. Well, thank you for telling us, uncle. Let's eat now, Shiro. She was acting her part of being a cheerful, clueless girl. But Shuriken was stuck thinking about Kanoha. Something big happened there. Was it related to Kurama or Shikaku? I, I should hurry up there. The next day, they left early in the morning. Now, they were more focused on reaching Kanoha as that was the only clue they got. On their way, they tried to ask a few people indirectly about Kurama or Shikako, but none had seen such a big animal anywhere. Don't worry, Shiro. I'm sure it was something else. Don't you remember the Achiha? And Senju had many abilities that let them do a lot of damage? It must be them fighting. Minari tried to make him feel better, but Shuriken was feeling uneasy. He hoped he could just fly there as soon as possible. Pat pat he patted the horse. You can do it run fast. They traveled for the next three days continuously. Instead of stopping at only villages, they started to stop whenever they felt too tired and set camps. The horses were from Dama village, so of course they were very strong and could run for hours at a stretch. The roads were mostly empty though as trade and economic activities were not that developed yet since the wars stopped not long ago. Also, there were many rogue ninjas who didn't join any village and stayed outside to steal and kill as they pleased. Minari and Shuriken met a fair share of them. They beat them to a pulp and tied them to the trees before heading forward. They even took away their equipment, from clothes to weapons. After a total of four days of continuous journey, they finally arrived at the gates of Kanahagakur. It was a giant gate, positioned into a larger wall that circled around the village as its border. They didn't know about the security aspect, though, as Shinobi could easily climb them. The door was open, there was nobody there, but Shuriken could feel a few presences that were constantly watching them. Meanwhile, Minari was acting like a normal civilian, just enjoying herself 
and being cheerful. Shiro, let's go. She said, and trotted through the gates. Stop. A voice came from the small shed on the left side of the gate. There were two shinobi inside. Both had normal ninja clothes and a headband of Kanahagakure village. Register yourself here before you enter, they told them. They got off their horses and walked to the shed. There was an open window, and on the other side, the ninja sat. Minari used her charm and asked, Sure, how do we register? There was a moment of silence as they both admired her beauty. But then they coughed and asked, Um, name? I am Minari Dama, and this is Shuriken Dama. We are from Dama Village further south, near the Hanguri Gulf. She replied, though she lied about the location of their village. Sure, it was south, but not near the gulf. Reason for the visit? They asked them. Oh, we just wanted to sightsee and maybe buy some tools for our village. Finally, the world is at peace, so what better time than now? She chirped. The two men nodded. Okay, you need to pay 1,000 Rio for entering and bringing in your horses. Author's note. Rio is based on the old Japanese currency. One Rio equals 10 yen. Also, one US dollar equals 100 yen. Hence, one US dollar equals 10 Rio. The guards just asked them for $100. Just divide Rio with 10 to find real world USD value. What? Why would you take money from people who are coming to spend more money in your village? Won't this scare away customers? Shuriken asked them as this didn't make sense. They looked at Shuriken. Their eyes widened a little. All this time, they had not even noticed it. Only when Minari introduced him, they saw him, but other times they didn't notice him. Kid, we need to maintain the infrastructure of this village, and for that, money is needed. All the money you'll spend in the village will belong to the people. A shinobi argued, but don't people pay tax? which is then used to make better buildings? Minari asked. She knew these men were trying to wrongfully take their money. You gotta pay the tax or you can't enter. We can't just let anybody enter the village. They spoke together. Shuriken sighed. He'd rather not deal with this right now. So he started to take out money from his pocket. I will deal with this when I find Kurama, he thought. Here. He proceeded to hand over the coins, but as soon as one of the ninjas stretched his arm to take it, out of nowhere another man appeared, and he with one arm caught the ninja's hand and on the other shuriken's. Shuriken looked at the tall man. He had long black hair, slightly tan skin, and a kind-looking face. He was wearing a match of white and red robes with a weird big hat on the head. I don't remember imposing any such tax on the visitors of our village. Can you remind me where in the rule book it is written? The man asked. Shuriken noticed that the two ninjas now seemed to be very scared for some reason. Whoosh! Just then another person appeared. He had ashen hair akin to white with two red lines on his cheek. He was wearing blue armor on his black underclothes. There was also the Kanahagakure headband. The two shinobi seemed more scared of him. Ah, Lord Hokage, Lord... Tobarama, we were just... They too had no way to justify this. It was clearly a case of corruption. What is a Hokage? Shuriken asked. The man looked at him kindly and answered, I'm the leader of this village, as well as its founder, Hashirama Senju. So you're like the daimyo, Shuriken replied. Haha, <laughs> yes, but a small one. What is your name? Hashirama asked back. Shuriken answered politely, as he felt respect for the man who ended the hatred and started this village. I am Shuriken Dama. This is my sister Minari. Hashirama nodded, but he felt very weird. On the one hand, he felt crazy power in the girl, while he felt nothing from Shuriken as if he wasn't even there. Well, Shuriken, I hope you will like this village. Now I must go. I have an important summit to visit. He patted Shuriken's shoulder and walked out of the gates, with more than ten others shinobi following. Meanwhile, Tobarama was beating the two corrupt ninjas. You two will sweep the streets for one month from now on. 
I will not tolerate such corruption. My brother may have gone soft, but remember, now that he's gone, I am the authority. Yes, yes. Forgive us, Lord Tobarama. The two apologized and ran away. Tobarama then looked at Minari. He felt his heart skip a beat. She was too beautiful and seemed equally strong. Sadly, unknown to him, she was taken and also in Uchiha. Then he noticed Shuriken and felt the same as Hashirama. Strange. Even normal people have a presence. He doesn't. I should keep an eye on them, he decided, and silently left without talking to them. He seems like the rude type, Minari commented. Shuriken shrugged. Let's go and search for information. That Hokage and this Tobarama are very powerful, I sensed it. Let's not mingle with them for now. Really? Even stronger than me? She inquired in surprise. He nodded. Tobarama may not be, but the Hokage is probably stronger. What about you? Can you beat them? She asked. He looked confused. I don't know. My core energy is very different from everyone else. I don't even know how strong I am. Uh, don't be sad, Shiro. I'm sure you're the strongest. Let's go, we'll find a good place to eat, and also start looking for clues from there. She cheerfully put her arm around his neck, and walked together. Many men walking past them looked at Shuriken enviously, but they also nodded after seeing how handsome he was. Tobarama immediately returned to the Hokage office and called a few trusted men and asked them to keep an eye on Shuriken and his activities. He had the register in his hand which had the information about Shuriken written. There is no village called Dama in the whole of the Land of Fire. The only place in the south that is still unexplored is the forest. That kid seems too strange. Could he be related to, but he seems too young. He talked to himself, pondering over Shuriken's identity. He was the cautious type, and believed in dealing with a problem before it arises with a hard hand. I need to make sure the village stays stable as long as Hashirama is at the Five Kages Summit. If his talks of peace fail, I will need to prepare for battle. He planned. This ramen is so tasty, Minari. I love it. But I'm still waiting to eat dumplings. Shuriken happily ate the food. Both of them were sitting at a decent looking restaurant. It serves all kinds of food here. What are you saying? This is bland at best. Cooks at Dama Village are so much better. But I guess to you it's tasty because you rarely ate anything other than dumplings. Seriously, you need to focus on your diet more. Do you want to become fat? She said while pulling his stuffed cheek slowly. But dumplings are just so tasty. I even have dreams of mountains of them. Shuriken replied and stuffed more of them. Hey, big sis, are you going to eat that? All of a sudden a voice came. Both Shuriken and Minari turned their heads to look, and standing there was a chubby boy with white hair and red marks under his eyes. He looked five or six years old. His mouth was visibly watering, looking at the extra ramen bowl on the table that Shuriken had not touched as he was only interested in dumplings. Do you want it? Minari asked. The boy cutely nodded and kept on looking at the bowl. But it belongs to this pretty sis. Shuriken looked at the boy awkwardly, and the boy was staring at him too. Big sis? Ah ha ha ha. Oh, Shiro, he thinks you're a girl. Minari laughed loudly, thumping on the table with her fist. Yes, this big sis is so pretty. Look, we have the same hair color. The boy said now even more confidently. I'm a man. Shuriken corrected him with a heavy voice. What? The boy was so shocked he fell back down on his. But, H, how can this be? How can a man be so pretty? This is against nature, you're lying, he argued. You can't have the ramen bowl now, I'm going to eat it all. Shuriken angrily took the bowl closer to himself. The boy quickly stood up and spoke with an apologetic look. He sorry, big brother. You are so handsome that I got confused. Look, we have the same same hair, we are like brothers. Won't you treat your brother? Sigh here, you can eat it. What's your name? 
Shuriken inquired. The boy happily sat beside him and started slurping on the ramen. He seemed so happy. I am Jiraiya. I'm gonna be the strongest shinobi someday. Minari felt this was the perfect opportunity to gather information. Kids mostly hear their parents talk, and also their friends, so they often know a lot about what's happening around them. Well, Jiraiya, I am Minari, and this here is Shuriken. We are new to Kanahaga Corps. Will you tell us about the village? What's going on around these days? She asked. Jiraiya suspiciously looked at her. Is she a spy? No, she's too pretty to be a spy. Ah, so pretty slurp. Welcome to the strongest shinobi village in the five nations. Everything is the best here. The food, the school, the bathhouses, hee hee. Oh, our Hokage is also the strongest. He replied, well, this wasn't much useful information. Who wants to know about bathhouses? What about safety? Is living here safe? Minari asked further. Jiraiya nodded. Of course, well, for the most part. Not long ago, that stupid friend of Hokage betrayed us and tried to destroy the village. He even brought a huge fox-like creature out too. As soon as he said that, Shuriken's fist tightened. But our Hokage was so strong, he beat both of them super easily. Big sister, can I get more ramen? Jiraiya asked as he had already licked his bowl clean. Minari also turned serious. She looked at the owner of the shop and signaled him to bring another bowl. So what happened to the fox and this man? She inquired. He 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 was defeated and died. But I don't know about the fox. It just went poof suddenly. I was watching the whole fight secretly. I'm sure Lord Hokage also beat the fox to death. Jiraiya replied. Just then the next bowl arrived. Shuriken couldn't sit still anymore. So, you don't know what happened to that fox. Who might know the- Oh, why are you asking about that fox? It's gone now. Jiraiya asked him back with a lifted eyebrow. Minari quickly intruded. He meant to know about the fox, after all. If the fox is still around somewhere, then this village is not safe to live in. Oh, I don't know then. I don't think anybody knows other than Lord Hokage. Maybe Lady Mito would. Also, Lord Tobarama might. Jiraiya replied honestly. Shuriken nodded. It was time to move. It was about to turn night. Perfect for infiltrating. He didn't care about anything now. The fact that Kurama was involved in something like this, it was worrying him. I hope you are not dead, Kurama. I don't want to wait a hundred years to see you again. But why did you fight for that man? He wondered. Shuriken stood up. Let's go, Minari. We have places to be. Thank you, Jiraiya. Here, take this money and eat as much as you want. Jiraiya took the few Rio coins without saying anything, as he was busy eating it. After that, both of them left the shop. But after they were gone and Jiraiya had eaten his food, he noticed the number on the coins. Whoa. They gave me a thousand Rio. Maybe I can buy that shuriken now. What are you planning on doing, Shiro? Minari asked, seeing him tensed up. Simple. Find either this Mito or Tobarama. And from the number of people I have felt following us all this time, I think we should meet Tobarama. He's the acting leader of the village. Shuriken planned. Minari sighed. Just don't do something too impulsive. We don't want to be seen as their enemies. We're just here for Kurama. But they harmed him. They hurt Kurama. I shouldn't have let him go in the first place. I was too stupid. Now I will do anything it takes to make our family whole again. Shuriken sternly replied. To him. His family came first. Everything came after that. He would only be charitable as long as his family was not harmed. And considering this was an official action of a village... He had no sympathy for it, but he was not a megalomaniac who would try to destroy it. The people did nothing wrong. The most powerful of the village did. So are we going to do it right now? She asked him. Yes, we should hurry up as much as possible. Who knows, Kurama could still be around waiting for our help. If this Tobarama does not know, 
then we will have to find the Hokage directly. He planned and sped up. They were headed straight to the Hokage office building. They are headed to the Hokage office. Call all the men on standby. Lord Toborama has told us to stay vigilant. If these two do anything strange, strike them. A man standing on a rooftop a distance away ordered his men. He was the vice commander of Umbu, a special force made to safeguard the Hokage. As Hashirama was outside with the commander, now it was his job to secure the temporary Hokage. He looked at the two outsiders running towards the office. Slowly, the two even started jumping on rooftops like ninjas. This made his belief strong that these two were far from being normal people. Could this be an attack from Sunagakir? He wondered. Whoosh! I can sense every single person around us. This place is riddled with ninjas. Shuriken informed her. The two of them stood right in front of the building. Minari asked him, What do you want to do? Should we go from the front door or barge in? I will always help you, no matter what you decide. He looked at her kind face with a smile. Thank you, but let's go through the front door. If he tries to fight us, this would turn into a battle anyway. With this decided, they walked towards the big cylindrical red building. There was a brown door as an entrance. Shuriken proceeded to knock on it. But just as his hand was about to touch the door, a sudden whoosh sound came and a man in a cat-like mask appeared. What do you want from Lord Toborama? You cannot enter this building. The man asked. He had a kanai in his hand, held at Shuriken's neck. The same was the case with Minari, as another person had arrived behind them. Of course... They let them do this. Otherwise, it was as easy to deal with them as yawning. We are looking for someone missing, and we believe that only Lord Toborama or Lord Hokage know about his whereabouts. Shuriken replied, with a kind smile plastered on his face. But his white hair and skin made him look very cold. It's very late. Come tomorrow, Lord Toborama will see you. The Umbu replied, Clank without anybody even realizing, Shuriken's hand was already on the kanai, holding it by the blade, and soon crushing it like it was glass. B.A.M., now the umbu had his neck in Shuriken's hand. It all happened so fast that nobody got a chance to react. On top of that, following Shuriken's movements was very hard through their senses, because he didn't have a normal chakra. Asterisk G.A.K. G.A.K. Asterisk, the umbu was choking, while he tried to push Shuriken's hand away. But he only got lifted in the air by him, as if he was not an adult man but a ragdoll. The umbu was in disbelief, because Shuriken looked like a teenage kid. How would you feel if your family was missing and someone told you to come tomorrow to look for them? Shuriken reasoned with him. Minari agreed with this action. They wouldn't have taken them seriously if Shuriken had not shown some real strength. At least now, they will hear them out. Clank, she also destroyed the kanai that was put on her neck and said, Look, we're not enemies of your village. We don't care about your wars or feuds. We're just desperately looking for our two family members. Thud, Shuriken, let the umbu go, throwing him to the ground. Can we enter now? The two umbu looked up, at the glass window of the Hokage office. From there, they saw a silhouette of someone nodding. Cough, yes, you two can go in. They said respectfully. Shuriken and Minari walked upstairs. An umbu was leading them in the front, but they could sense many eyes were on them. There were even some inside the walls, for some reason. Soon, they arrived at a normal looking door. The umbu knocked on it and let them go inside. Shuriken looked around at the room first. It was filled with a lot of papers and books. There was a big semicircular window that overlooked the village. And then there was the main table behind which the white-haired person sat. Toborama was intently looking at Shuriken, trying to find out why he could not sense the boy even when he stood right in front of his eyes. This was something he had never felt in his entire life. And it truly made him feel a little scared. This boy could technically just walk behind him and stab him to death. 
without him even realizing someone was there. Where are you from? I want the truth, he asked them in an authoritative tone. Where is Kurama? And I want the truth, Shuriken asked back. Tobarama didn't like this. Don't forget you are standing in my village. You are surrounded by ninjas here. And worse, there is me. Confidence is good, but overconfidence always sinks the ship. Yuki told me this. Tell me, where is Kurama? The big red fox the Hokage fought not long ago. Shuriken asked once again with a stern voice. Tobarama was amused by this question. Nobody in the world, at least from what he heard, knew the name of that demon fox. Here, the strange boy was calling the name so affectionately. Is this Kurama, the family member you have been looking for? Tobarama inquired. Yes, he's the only reason I even came here. I don't need anything else, and neither do I want to fight someone. Just tell me where he is, and I will leave peacefully. Shuriken told him straightforwardly. Tobarama was not going to do it. He'd rather fight than give up the demon fox. It was a deterrent for wars. It was the guarantee of peace for their wounded village. It is not possible. He killed many of us and was involved in a ploy to destroy our village. Tobarama replied, prepared to fight. And who was responsible for all this? Wasn't there someone else who probably forced him to fight? Kurama may be an angry being, but he's not dumb or senseless. He wasn't even supposed to be here. He was on his way to the desert to look for Shikaku. Shuriken tried to reason. Shikaku? Desert? Sanagakir? Didn't they also catch a tailed beast? Tobarama's brain immediately came up with a scheme. Who is this Shikaku? He tried to act oblivious and asked. He's also a family member, as big as Kurama but made of sand. Shuriken replied, hoping for some information. Tobarama acted as if he had just realized something. I did hear about Sunagakir catching a giant wild beast. They have been quite vocal about it telling everyone they are the strongest now. Shuriken's worst fear turned into reality. Shikaku was indeed caught. His innocent heart felt very guilty for even letting Shikaku go. If he had stopped him, nothing would have happened. Minari, who was silent till now, asked, Do you know how they caught him? Tobarama shook his head. No, probably some sealing jutsu. What about Kurama? Where is he? Shuriken questioned him. He was being respectful, even though he was about a hundred years old. Much older than most people in the world. Senegakir should have a headache coming towards them now. Tobarama was happy with his plot. We don't know. He's certainly not in this village. You can search for him if you want. From what I know, after that fight with Madara Achiha, the demon fox was gone. Tobarama replied, in a way, he was not lying. Yes, after the fight, Kurama disappeared because he was sealed. And yes, he was not in the village since Mito Uzumaki was sent to the home of the Uzumaki clan, Yuzushigakure. Shuriken nodded and turned to Minari. Let's go and find the leader of Sunagakure first. I will try to peacefully ask him to free Shikaku. I don't think they will agree peacefully. Wait, isn't there a five Kage summit going on? The leaders of all five villages will be there. We can meet the leader of Sunagakir right away. Minari suggested. Shuriken was completely in favor. Let's go then. Thank you, Tobarama. We shall leave now. In the blink of an eye, both of them disappeared from their place. The only thing that signified that they had left was the open door of the office and the building. Are you sure, my lord? Sending them away like this. Tobarama's disciple spoke up. This was one of the three students of Tobarama, but he was the best of them. Hiruzen Saratobi, a 23-year-old powerful jounin, with a very good possibility of surpassing even Tobarama. No Irusen. They are indeed very strong. I can feel it. Especially that woman. I feel the same as I did around Madara. And that boy, I cannot even sense him. I just made trouble for Sunagakir, and I'd rather not destroy this office when we just repaired it. Tobarama replied, revealing his plot. 
But Hiruzen was confused. Won't they eventually know that we have the demon fox? They will surely come then. I did not technically lie. And even if they do come, Hashirama and I will be here at the same time. Nobody can fight us together and win. Toborama proudly replied. Constant winning had gotten to his head, it seemed. Even though he was a cautious person, his analytical abilities were starting to depreciate. Toborama then called an umbu. Quickly, send the fastest ninja and inform the Hokage about these two. He must know the plan I have plotted, and also not to interfere if these two engage in a fight with the Kazakage. But none in the world except a few could match Shuriken and Minari's speed. They had left the horses in the village and had run on foot. They hoped to meet the entourage of Hokage and then follow him to the destination. Do you think he was telling the truth? Shuriken asked Minari. She shook her head. I don't know. His face was impossible to read. It looked as if the man didn't have any feeling. Me too, I felt weird when he was speaking. Hokage seemed nice. Maybe he will tell us everything honestly. That is why I agreed to leave so quickly. Shuriken said, I hope you are right, but I'm still confused. How in the hell did the mighty Shikaku get caught by ninjas? She wondered. Shuriken had no idea. He had zero knowledge about the rest of the world. He had no idea how powerful the people were. He was regretting never learning about it. All his life, he lived in this bubble created around him by the overprotective tailed beasts. Now the same thing was becoming a hindrance for him in understanding the world. Whoosh they did not find where Hashirama was, but they followed the trail left on the dirt road, and as not many people traveled on them, the footmarks stayed for a good long time. They ran around for three days looking for where the meeting was taking place. It could possibly be happening anywhere in the world. But Shuriken decided to first check the country of Fire Fully. After three days, they finally saw a small building in the middle of nowhere in a jungle. It looked out of place because the building was very well kept. Shuriken knew that there would be very tight security, so he couldn't just barge in. He stopped a good distance away and planned. Minari, you stay here. I will sneakily go there and see what they are talking about. If everything goes well, I will ask them about both Kurama and Shikako. He planned. But I'm supposed to safeguard you. She protested. He quickly stopped her. But they will sense you in a minute. While I cannot be sensed even if I am standing in front of them. Eventually, she had to agree as there wasn't much else they could do. So he left her and slowly proceeded towards the building. He could sense everyone there, but nobody could sense him. Due to this, he easily passed all the guard perimeters. After that, he jumped over to a window of the building and used the normal blending sheet to hide there, blending himself with the surrounding area. From there, he started to listen in, but unknown to poor Shuriken, his whole worldview was about to change. The leaves of the trees fluttered, but a strange sense of silence remained. The tens of various shinobi around made sure the location was secured. But Shuriken was already listening to everything from outside the large window. Inside, five men were sitting around a table. They were the leaders of the five strongest shinobi villages. Behind each of them was also someone, probably their assistants or security personnel. Putting his whole focus on what was going on, he heard the names of all of them and their villages. From Kanahagakur, it was Hokage Hashirama Senju. From Sunagakur, it was Kazakage Reto. Kirigakur had Mizukage by Akurin. Then there was Reikage from Kumogakur, and finally Tsuchikij Ishikawa from Awagakur. All these villages were not very friendly to each other and chased after more resources and profits for themselves. But they also didn't want a war, hence they had gathered here to try to balance the power. Hashirama talked first, for the peace and prosperity of all our people. We must not fight. We are all newly formed villages, and we need to focus on gathering wealth. Kazakage Reto scoffed. Huh, 
Your concept of peace does not apply everywhere, Hasharama. Your village and your country sits on fertile lands, while ours is in a desert, where food and water are hard to come by. There is no profit for us in peace. We must make peace by fighting. Are you declaring war on us? Reiki just sternly asked. His face looked serious and ready to fight. Hashirama immediately tried to stop them and came to the main point. Calm down, please. We are not here to fight, but to find a solution. As you all know, Kanoa now possesses the power of the mighty nine-tailed demon fox. I have a solution for you to not feel threatened by this. I will catch the rest of the beasts and sell them to you. As soon as Shuriken heard this outside, a vein popped up on his head. SL? Sell my family? Tobarama lied to me. Kanoha did have Kurama. They will pay for this Shuriken looked back inside after hearing the loud voice of Kazakage Reto. Ha! Huh. We don't need them. We have already caught the one tail. Instead, we want something else. As a payment, you must give the country of wind a portion of the fertile land of the land of fire, as well as 30% of all the money you will get from selling the tailed beasts to the other villages. Kazakage demanded. This enraged everyone in the room. Mizukage, Rakage, and Suchikage stood up, fingers pointed at Kazakage. We will declare war against Sunagakir then. This will teach you a lesson. Hashirama voiced. Calm down, let's talk first. I am sure we can come up with a reasonable solution. And yes, Sunagakir's demand is too outrageous. Remember, I am selling you all the tailed beasts in the captured state. I am strong enough to easily capture them with my wood release. But if any of you were to try to capture them, many of your experienced shinobi will die in the process. You have the option of getting them peacefully. And my final offer to Sunagakir is an agreement for the sale of a limited amount of crops to you at the cost price. And for the next three years, we will send 100 tons of crops to you for free, so you can become self-sufficient in the meantime. I also offer the possibility of leasing land to grow crops on. The lease must get renewed every 10 years. And to the other villages, I will sell the tailed beasts. Hashirama mediated and offered them. Do you even know where they are? Rakage asked. Hashirama nodded confidently. I have some doubts about their location. But I assure you, I can find and capture them. Slowly, each agreed. All villages were buying two beasts, except Sunagakir, as they did not have much money to buy them and currently needed food urgently. There was still one beast left, and it was decided that it would be given to Takigakir, a small yet strong shinobi village. Like the intelligent vultures they were, they decided the fate of ancient intelligent beings easily. They planned on enslaving them and trading them as goods. For the first time in his life, Shuriken was face to face by the animalistic and barbarian nature of humans. What peace, what truce. They went from warring clans to warring villages and countries, and now more bodies will be slain, more lives will be lost. They don't care about anybody except themselves. Their greed knows no bounds, and they want to capture my family, enslave them? Why is Hashirama so confident in catching them all? There were thousands of questions in his mind. He couldn't understand why they wanted to enslave the Bijou. Wouldn't it be better to not touch them and let all villages be equally powerful? He questioned himself about what he should do. He wanted to harm these men, he wanted to hurt them, and for the first time, kill someone. But he wondered if he was strong enough to beat all of them at once. They were the five strongest men of the five strongest villages. Shuriken knew his powers were boundless, but he was not at the level where he could flick anybody to the side. What if they keep me busy and that Hashirama goes to capture them? He thought of the risk. He remembered the words of Gyuki. You never get into a fight you know you can't win. If you have a chance to avoid it, avoid it. Get stronger and beat them later. Shuriken's face seemed blank, but cold and hidden anger appeared. He didn't seem like the happy and playful Shiro anymore. Wushi jumped back from the rooftop. 
and returned to Minari carefully. Minari had hidden herself well there, but Shuriken easily found her, as they were in a jungle full of natural energy. What happened? What's with that face? They didn't agree. Minari asked him with a tensed face. Shuriken denied. I did not talk to them. Minari, they are worse than animals. Kurama was caught by Kanoha. And now Hokage is planning on selling all other bijou to other villages as tools of wars. To be enslaved and imprisoned in a seal. What? Are they crazy? How will they even do that? All of them combined are very powerful. Minari asked in shock. I don't know. That Hashirama is very confident. He said he alone can catch them easily with his wood release. We need to hurry back to the village and hide everyone. Quick! He decided with urgency. Minari agreed immediately. There were just two of them here. Fighting them was pointless right now as they will only be slowed. They sped up at full speed towards the village. The sooner they returned the sooner they could start evacuating. Hashirama did not know the kind of damage he had inflicted on a peaceful loving family. To him, all the tailed beasts were just giant monsters. His first and only interaction with a beast was with Kurama, who was known to show anger and had a superiority complex. So his belief that all the beasts were like this grew in his head. In his mind, he was just creating everlasting peace. He guessed that as long as he was alive, no tailed beast could threaten Kanoha. And as Senju were known for their long lives, he knew he would live to see Kanoha prosper. Then it's decided, I will immediately head out and capture the beasts. After one week, all of us will meet here again. You can bring the money as well as the person you will be sealing the beast inside. The Uzumaki clan will help us in sealing the beasts. Hashirama said in his final remarks. With that, all the Kage left for their countries with a satisfying feeling, as all got something in return today. Hashirama also donned his red armor, armed himself with his Senja scroll, through which he could summon countless trees for his wood release and headed out. Shuriken and Minari were just about to reach their home. They had ditched their excess luggage to increase their speed. That bastard Tobarama lied. We should have nabbed his neck right there. Minari was very angry right now. It seemed as if the whole world was against them. All this for no reason, they had never tried to harm anybody. All the bijou and villagers just lived peaceful lives, never harming anyone. Shuriken was not speaking. He was afraid that if he spoke, he would get angrier, and he wanted to stay level-headed. Let's talk to Gyuki. He is the most null. Watch out! Shuriken stopped speaking midway, and leapt forward to grab Minari, and jump to the side. He did not jump just a few meters, but a few hundred meters away. Minari was shocked, unable to realize what had happened. But then she heard, Bio Boem, something fell from the sky. It fell with such intensity that a huge crater formed on the ground, destroying countless trees in a large radius. The destruction was intensified by the strong wind formed by the impact, and with that, a big cloud of dust also formed. Cough, cough, what was that? Hashirama, Minari wondered loudly. I don't know, but I, I feel a very different aura from that dust cloud. It's much different from any ninja. It's closer to Kurama and all. Shuriken muttered, confused himself. FWOSH all of a sudden a big tornado formed in the destroyed crater and it sucked all the dust. With that the field became clear and everything was visible. Just one man was standing in the middle. He had white long hair, white skin and horns on his head. That's not a human, Shuriken felt. He was having a very ominous feeling now. So he whispered into Minari's ears. Quickly run to the village and tell them to evacuate as soon as possible. I will hold this person, I don't think he came here for the bijou. But if this large destruction was just from his landing, I can't imagine his full blows. The village might get destroyed by his attacks. Minari nodded, knowing the lives of everyone in the village were at stake, 
Just don't die, please. Shuriken smiled at her. Of course, I still need to learn about that special goodbye you were talking about. You knew what it was. She exclaimed with widened eyes. He chuckled. I may be naive, but I'm not a fool, Minari. I have eyes and have lived for more than thrice your current age. Minari just lightly punched his chest, but she felt something different about him. Where was the innocent Shiro? Why was he acting so differently? She wondered if the mental fatigue caused this change. She came close to him and kissed his forehead. She loved this little brother dearly. Go now. He pushed her away. Once she was gone, Shuriken focused on the weird human. He did not go towards him though, as he felt a little nervous. He had not felt any kind of threat from any shinobi yet. Not even Hashirama, but from this person, he was feeling danger. Then, to his surprise, the man started flying in the air and slowly hovered towards him. Ha ha ha. You have no idea how many galaxies and realities I searched for you. You thought you could run away from us after taking the source? Ha. Huh. The only reason for your existence is so that you can be dissected and researched upon for my people to get stronger. You caused me too much shame in front of my clan. I was going crazy to redeem myself. And I have finally found you. And that concludes this episode. If you enjoyed it, I'd seriously love it if you guys could leave a like on the video as it genuinely helps out so much. And it keeps me going. Plus, it takes only one second. That said, have a wonderful day. See you in the next one.